five, four, three, two, one. All right. We are recording. Welcome to the Danger Zone, Zachary. We are back at the compound. Yeah. Where are we at? <laughs> In an undisclosed location. Exactly. We'd tell you, but, you know, we'd have to kill you. Yeah. And then you'd have to sponsor us, or at least your family would. Someone would. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're also, I mean, the compound could also be called the B Triple C. It could be. For those that don't know, they never will. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, you mind uh, beering me a whiskey? Oh, sure. I think I need a beer that tea. Yep, here you go. And cheers. It's tasty. Oh man, I was expecting the uh, one we had last time. No, they're different. Uh, and I like inhaled that somehow. Okay. <laughs> mm. I remember my first whiskey. Yeah, this is apparently. also brewed in a local region to the compound. Yeah, this actually re- reminded me of my first whiskey, the way I drank it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me set this up for... Oh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's dive into a couple topics here. I believe this is how we started our last one. It's how we should start everyone. Yeah, I agree. Um, so... First of all, I'll start the first topic. Yeah. Let's talk about mustache regulations. First of all, yours is in the epitome of regulation of the compound. But oh, let's talk yeah. about elsewhere. Huh? Hmm. <laughs> well, I consider mine a gentleman's stash. Not everybody grows one like this. It's uh, it's kind of got a flow to it, if you will. <laughs> it's not what I describe as some people as having a caterpillar caterpillar stash, that the hairs just come like poof, straight straight out. Straight out. And then uh, they just get, like, really bushy. Mine is still full, but has, like, a flowing, flowingness to it. Um, it is full and flowing. It's, more, it's more refined. I was going to say something about the guys with this, the big, bushy, like a Walter Cronkite or, yeah. you know, Burt Reynolds mustaches yeah. or Sam Elliott. Yeah, but anyways, we, I was known to have a mustache before I had this beard once I got out and when we weren't like out and not shaving or whatever I, even when we were back in the US I always had a mustache since 2009 basically I started growing a mustache and then a woman wanted to marry me in- instantly <laughs> I remember you saying <laughs> Christina liked your mustache and that was before we met her so we were kind of afraid to meet her of who this girl might be <laughs> Go figure, I had found the secret. <laughs> you find a woman that likes a man with a mustache, and she's the one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I started growing it out at Dive Medicine, like before I came to you guys, at first Street Comp Battalion, before I got orders there. And once I got there, I showed up to the platoon. Um, Penny Franks took over. And as our platoon sergeant, and the one of the first things he told me was, "You, as the corpsman, it's your job to push the, the limits, the limits of can. the regulations yeah. as far as you can, so we can live vicariously through you." <laughs> because you're the only one that can get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Because you're in the navy, and so I took that to heart, and I was just following orders basically, and. Do you remember it? How, like, I had it curled almost oh, like absolutely. this. Up on my cheeks, <laughs> like, it's totally out of range. I don't know how you got that far with it. I know, and I, like, I got to the point where I was like, I felt How weird. was nobody saying anything? Exactly. <laughs> it was like Gunny Franks had blessed me with this protective <laughs> bubble. like an aura around yeah, you that no one could That, like, nobody with. could see. <laughs> it's not like you would have to... You know, be like, oh, come here close so I can see if your mustache is out, Rex. I had it curled <laughs> up my cheeks like an inch. But, uh, yeah, and I'd walk past first, Arch and everything, and I'd be like just waiting for the 
you know. It's hard to happen here. Yeah. And I didn't actually get in trouble for it until we got in Afghanistan. It's funny how that is, huh? Yeah. Oh, it's okay when we're just back, you know, playing fake war. Mm. But uh, we actually go to war, and now all of a sudden my mustache becomes a well, you know, when hot topic. Well, you know, hair is out of regulations, you're completely combat incapable. Yeah. It's, it's not pure science. <laughs> Maybe it's because I had to buzz my head for my first deployment, oh, which I, I robbed you guys of. I did it myself. Yeah. You guys were kind of pissed about that. Yeah, but maybe when you buzz your head, then it just drew all the attention to your mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, but I developed... So, so the reason we bring this up is uh, someone actually messaged me on Instagram <laughs> from my Mother's Day post because I have a mustache in that. And we're doing some training out at... Uh, pre-deployment training out at Fort Irwin for one of my deployments. And uh, I did like a little Mother's Day post where I like hold a sign that said like, Happy Mother's Day or whatever. And, but anyways, he, he was like, you know, epic stash or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I think he's a, a civilian or just doesn't understand. But he, he was like, do you guys have like mustache competitions or whatever? Like he can grow the, the most, they're the best. And I was like, yeah, but I was kind of like always in a mustache competition <laughs> with myself, with I guess. Yeah. Like, people would go them out for Movember or deployment stashes. You're in it for life. And that was like, I guess, you know, that's where guys would compete. But, yeah, I was in it to win it. <laughs> um, plus, most of my power is derived from the stash. Yeah. That's where you get it from. Yeah. Um, funny, there's a couple instances where I'd run into, like, a sergeant major in the channel line. Like when we'd come back from missions. And I learned that as long as you're really confident about what the Navy regs were, you could just make it up. Oh, sure. They just look to pray on the week, and if you give them <laughs> the slightest stutter, they'll just blow that up. But, yeah, if you can speak confidently in anything, any, uh, you know, any of the higher-ups will try and yeah. come and dwell on you for something. You just, just act confident in what you say, and whether you, you could be 100% bullshit, but if you're confident in the way they go about it, then it kind of throws them back, and they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't mess with this guy. You know what I couldn't stand about, like, for sergeants and sergeant majors and stuff? is like, they start looking at you, and they're just... They're just looking for something. Looking for something oh, that's absolutely. wrong. It's like, motherfucker, I'm hungry. <laughs> I've just been out, like, eating MREs and first strike meals. Which were terrible. <laughs> they were not good. <laughs> For 30 days straight. Like, all I want is to mow down on whatever hot meal is, like, waiting for me behind these, like, doors. And you would think that somebody that's been in for 20-plus years would have a little better agenda to do with their career than to sit there and wait for someone to walk in with their sleeves rolled up or their boots bloused, you know? Yeah. And just, like, it, it kind of bothers me, even on a very basic level of, like, him being a man and me being a man. You can kind of see, like, them go through this whole process in their head of just, like, they're having to figure out a way to, like, pull their balls out to, like, <laughs> confront you, you know? It's almost like they have to overcome their unmanliness or whatever to, like, confront you about it. It's weird, <laughs> and I don't like it. So I would just get get back at them, and as soon as they, I, I would let them build up all this. You, you just watch them build it up in their head. They're like planning what they're gonna say to you, like, "Oh, I'm gonna totally rip this guy a new one, and then I'm gonna feel so good about myself," you know. And so as soon, I would wait till right when they're about to, and they'd be like, uh, "So uh, uh, your mustache," and they're waiting for you to be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," oh, you know, like you just go along with whatever they say or just listen to them. And I'd be like. Well, actually, Sergeant Major, the Navy regulations uh, third one three zero zero point six says that the mustache can protrude three quarters of an inch past a line on the lip right here, and mine are obviously within those regs. Mm -hmm. So, and they'd be like, "You just totally deflate them, throws them off guard, and kind of gets them away from their other thought of everything else they're yeah. gonna throw through at you." So they'd pause and be like, "Uh." Okay, well, uh, I'm glad you I'm glad you understand it, and or or they would be like, well, since I haven't, since I don't know the Navy regs, I'm just gonna have to take your word, <laughs> and then the situation would be over, 
and I would just lie, and I would, I knew where my mustache was, and I would just say the number. <laughs> I would change it like, half an inch, three quarters. Every inch. few months, <laughs> hey, no, no more than five inches past the line of the left. <laughs> yeah, you know us Navy guys. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Fuck those guys. <sighs> but you handled that drink a little better than the first one. Yeah, it's because uh, I filtered it with my mustache. <laughs> 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 Whiskey tastes so much better when it's filtered through a nice mustache. And when you can taste it for about 30 seconds after that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, yeah, that's enough talking about that. I mean, I think you look really good with a beard. Yeah. I think you need to keep it. Uh, it's past the itchy stage, and I think it looks pretty good, too. Mm-hmm. But it's starting to get pretty hot out here. That's true. And I got to spray, you know, when I'm out in the yard every day, I got to spray buck spray all over me, so then I have to just clean it real good every night, or else it just, you know, gets in. But beards and mustaches protect your face from the sun. That's true. That's another reason why I cancer. shouldn't shave because I got sunburned yesterday real bad. So if I shave, my face is going to be half red and half white. So now I have to keep it for a while. Yeah. Then you'll be a, what, a red face? Yeah. Is that half a red skin? Yeah. Uh, here we go with the, uh, we're already going to get banned. <laughs> oh, I said, uh, the, said the Russian word, huh? But I think a lot of guys don't give their mustache the time it needs. It takes a long time. It takes, I would say, most guys give up after a week if they're even that strong. Huh. Usually it's a couple of days and they're like, ah, this isn't working out. <laughs> it's just not how it works. You got to be dedicated. I think if I was to shave, it takes a solid month for it to resemble something that's respectable. Uh, you yeah, just have to be willing to yeah, like. For me, it's it's multiple months, you know, just for it to be good enough to do something with. Yeah. But most people just chicken out. Yeah. It's easy, it's easy to do. Yeah. And, and that's the sad thing about November is like people only have a month and it's this funny deal and you everybody's just like, a month. Yeah. yeah. Oh, another point, people that call it a molesta stash, which a lot of first sergeant sergeant majors do, you know what, fuck you. <laughs> I'm not a fucking molester. And I don't know how that fucking gained so much popularity, calling it that. A molestash. Yeah. yeah. You know, someone laughed and it made him feel good, so then they could just go off on that. Yeah, but it's it's actually like pretty offensive thing to accuse somebody of. Hmm. And Very you're, offensive. And you're, I mean, you're asking to just get punched in the face, <laughs> calling somebody a molester. Like, that's sick. Molesters are sick. Very much and it's so. a huge problem. <laughs> and to make light of it about mustaches, I don't think is a good deal. No, freedom of speech and all that, but, you know, my freedom to punch you in the face as well. If only it worked that way. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, so needless to say, yeah. I, I have beef with <coughs> m- most first, first sergeants. And sorry, yeah, major. just about like them just picking on every single regulation. Um, when we went to Iraq with recon, you know, they would give us, uh, we would give them a set of camis, and then they would give us, they made the name tapes of Velcro, you know, so that way if you went on a mission, you could just take your Velcro off, and, you know, you don't have your name or your unit or anything, or you're just Marines. And so, these were issued to me, and we were in sniper school, and I was wearing them, and, you know, we run to the chow hall to get lunch, and we have, you know, 10 minutes to eat, so I'm in there at the salad bar trying to eat, and the sergeant major of SOI, the infamous... Sergeant Major Vines comes up to me and looks at me and is like, now excuse me, like what are those little devices on your blouse there, young Marine? Like, like he doesn't fucking know what they are. Exactly. That's what that's what I hate. You know, or if, you know, they come up to someone and you clearly didn't shave that day. And you woke up later, or who knew you just didn't do it. They come up and say, did you shave this morning when you clearly, yeah, clearly didn't? So what kind of question is that? Are you just trying to catch me in a lie too, or are you trying to? You know, why don't you just come up and say, I noticed you didn't shave this morning. Is there a reason? So, did you shave this morning? Yeah. It's like, are you fucking blind? Clearly I didn't, you know? <laughs> so he comes up and I was like, what are those little apparatus or those little devices? I think he said apparatuses. I was like, it's Velcro. I want to say, look, you can pull it off and stick it on your head. But that would have been uh, <laughs> probably racist. <laughs> but, yeah. 
But um, as, you know, he's like, you know, those aren't authorized. I'm like, well, Sergeant Major, they were issued to me from my unit, and since they were issued to me, I'm authorized to wear them in the field setting, and which where you are. And he's like, well, just don't wear them here again, you know, because you're right, but was, he still wants to. Oh yeah, and they're completely unauthorized yeah. in garrison use. But at that point, when you know going through sniper school, you run on an hour of sleep and. You're running everywhere with 100 pounds on your back. I could care less at that point what some guy cared about what I was wearing. <laughs> yeah, I think you nailed it, though. I, well, again, what, that's what, the thing. You know, if I was like, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Sergeant Major, you know, then he just feed off it, and then, yeah. he, then he gets above, then he gets the upper hand, you know, then he just feeds off it. And, oh, what about this? What about this? But if you say, well, you know, they were issued to me, so therefore I am yeah. authorized to wear them, and he's like, oh, um, someone might know what they're talking about, so I'm just going to let it go. Yeah, but that's the thing. Is there? They run into guys like us, and we actually stand up, and it, it trips them out. But what they're looking for is somebody to pick on. They're just that's, bullies. That's exactly what it is. They just want the somebody that like come to them. Then they just feed off yeah, that, and, and then they just hammer into you more. Oh yeah. And I guess me growing up, like I always stood uh, stood up for the small guys. I was the oldest guy in my class, and like kind of bigger. And I would not put up with bullies. It, it like drives me insane. Like. But the uh, but you nailed it with how they they go about it, like the way he approached you and the way he's like asking you, "What are those apparatuses?" It's like, like they come up to me, like, <laughs> "What is this mustache on your face?" It's like, yes, there is a mustache on my face. <laughs> Wait, like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> oh my gosh, how did that get there? You know? Yeah. Like, or what is this on your face? It's like you know what it is on my face. <laughs> <laughs> And then you proceed to call it a molasses stash. Like, you know it is a mustache. Yeah. And they play dumb and they just want to get you. Yeah, they just want to roll into hammering you. But, um, yeah, Sergeant Major Vines, what a piece of work. We'll leave it at that. What a piece of work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, non-standard uniforms, that was always an issue. And that brings me to, well, I go on this all day. Speaking of non-standard uniforms, what kills me is how the upper echelon of the military, or Marine Corps in general, thinks that if everyone looks the exact same, everyone has the exact same gear, everyone's going to operate much better. But the thing is, some people's feet are more sensitive than others, you know, so everyone wears the exact same boot. You're not going to get the exact same, you know, product at the end of the mission, you know. So that uh, was the biggest just factors where, oh, you can't wear non-standard issue boots, even though if it is tactical and color, and color, and it no one's going to see you. And if it does make you last longer on a, you know, 30-mile hike, you know, yeah. or, you know, or you can wear your issued ones that you have to wear, and you get blisters after two miles, you know. It's like, what's really important here, you know, mission accomplishment or not killing your guys or... Make sure and ensure everyone looks the exact same when you get on the helicopter. It's yeah. that mentality that destroys, destroys, you know, good units, destroys yeah. missions, you know, just dest destroys. It's a, it's a huge distraction. And it's a unnecessary distraction. Yeah. It's, yeah, you're worried about getting in trouble. And then they forced everybody to wear the boots at first. You know, what, what killed me, our very first mission, and what... What probably the worst thing is when you're your small unit leadership, you know, your platoon size leadership or even company level won't stand up for what they know is right. They'll just bow down and say, you know, yes, Sergeant Major, you're right. You know, they should all be wearing the same boots. Remember, yeah, like, with all your vast combat exactly. experience. Exactly. And in our, in our first Trek Now, I'm pretty sure we had, we, correct me if it was either Trek Now or one of them, where we had to pack our non issued boots into our ruck and wear, everyone had to wear our issued boots. Uh, you know, on the helicopter, and then when we got there, we could change over. It's like, okay, so you just made me carry an extra how many pounds for nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that was Trek Nawa round two. I think so too. Yeah. Because in the first one, we they, got, they realized guys got their feet fucked up. Yeah. Even though I went through, because I know you guys, like, we'd been discussing this, like the leadership and the platoon stuff. We're like, how, and me and the other Sarks, and we're like, how can the other medics, we're like, how can we. Convey get, this. Con convince them to let us wear boots that are going to work and not tear up guys' feet. Because we already had, just being in Afghanistan on Camp Leatherneck, 
guy's feet were already getting messed up oh, being yeah. being in those boots all day. <clears throat> and so we actually wrote up a report and I took I went around and took pictures of all you guys' feet. Remember that? Yeah, I remember like I can wear I could wear the shoe boots for, you know, twenty miles, not have a problem. I've always had, you know, iron feet. But some people like Jake, he's one of the most fit people you'll ever meet in your life. And yeah. just the issued boots just kill his feet. But give him a set of Merrells and he'll, you know, run for years, you know. It's just yeah. everyone's feet are different and So I took I took picker, pictures of all, all the feet problems that were happening and we submitted them up and they were like, Yeah, no, we don't care. Too bad. Yeah. You must look the same. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And the person that's making those decisions is, you know, sitting in an air conditioned office yeah. while we're, you know, on a thirty day mission. And their boots are still like new, they're not even like broken in. <laughs> but yeah, you know, that's how it is and that's probably how it always will be. Your your boots shrunk on you and you have what size shoe do you wear? Fourteens. Uh, Fourteens. <laughs> I remember, and yeah, my your shoes went to like a size ten. It was ridiculous. <laughs> just all the canal crossings. Just, yeah, I was like, okay, well, you guys don't. Have, and the, the fronts and that's of the them thing. were like, and that was the thing. I was like, okay, well, my boots don't fit me anymore. Mm-hmm. And I went to supply, and their biggest size is ten. So what do you expect me to do? You know, yeah. I have my perfectly good, you know, civilian boots that work just fine. But uh, you're gonna make me use like butter and a shoehorn to get my foot in this boot just because. Dude, it I remember looks the watching same. you trying to get those things on. <laughs> yeah. <'Cause, laughs> I Terrible. Know, yeah, I don't know if it's just the Afghanistan but. water. But after that person, they just like literally just like shrunk like plaster to my foot. <laughs> um, luckily, I, I told my brother some of this knowledge of. I forgot about that. I remember like sitting there, just like, yanking. I was like, yeah. oh, I don't know how to get these things off, man. <laughs> I was explaining to my younger brother, who's just commissioned as an officer. I told him, "You have to make your own way in the yeah. military." Every man makes his own way in this life, as my quote goes. But, so I, in my forward thinking and deception tendencies, I packed out, even though we weren't supposed to, the first mission, I packed out my civilian boots, my lowest. Mm -hmm. And I purposely wore a pair of boots, the bait lights, that were like the soles were coming apart (laughs) on them. (laughs) (laughs) They were like falling off. And I knew, I was like, if there's any chance, if, if I totally destroy these boots, they're not going to have an option but to let me wear the other ones that <laughs> I happen to bring, my backup ones. And that's exactly what happened. As soon as we got to that first compound, I like basically cut off the bottom of my sole. And I was like, well, hey, I got to wear these. Like, this is the only option. And they're like, <laughs> okay, well, you're in the Navy, so only you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys are still screwed. It's yeah. like, made no sense. But I was good, man. My feet felt so good. I was yeah. like, I'm glad yeah. your feet felt good. Yeah. I was able to jump across those canals like Michael Jordan. Just like, <laughs> what? Oh, those canal crossings are fun. Dude, probably one of the funniest moments. It makes me laugh so hard when I think about it is Greg Gadisi falling in the canal <laughs> when we were on a patrol. Because <laughs> we were in the end of the patrol line and it was this super deep canal. We were patrolling from OP3. And uh, it was a super deep one, like filled with like sewage and stuff in the bottom. And I'm talking like 10 feet deep or something (laughs) like that. And super wide across. And everybody's jumping across, jumping across, jumping across. You know, Greg's like a little shorter. (laughs) And so like I jump across and barely make it. And I'm a six foot dude. I'm like... I'm like, oh man, he's gonna have problems. I gotta watch this. So as <laughs> I like, I turn around, and he's like, gets ready. He like sprints up, jumps with everything he's got, and he, and his like leg hits the, his like foot hits the other side, and he just the look on his face as oh. we like met eyes, and he just like reaches out with his hand. To like catch mine, like and we like touch. fingertips like <laughs> touch, and I see this look in his face of just like total despair. He's like <laughs> knowing that he's going in. <laughs> he just falls back, and he's just <gasps> bloop, <laughs> like ten feet down into the sewage. Uh-huh. We had to like get him up, and then it was so funny. It was dark out, so like we had our nods on, and every time I would turn on in the night vision, I would just see. 
this like black line <laughs> up around his nipples <laughs> down was just completely <laughs> soaked and he just had this pissed off look oh, on yes. his face <laughs> the whole rest of the patrol it was hilarious every time i looked around i was just like <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah yeah those, those cross over fun yeah one of those we had with gates and uh we were going up there, and we were trying to trying to look. I was like, "Nah, it's pretty wide, but it doesn't look too deep." And so he jumps in, and all of a sudden, just like up to his chest, you know, like, "Oh crap!" All right. And so I tried pulling him up, I couldn't. So Clark was behind us, so he comes out, and then I had to pull Gaskin. You know, we're in the middle of you know Afghanistan, so they put their guns on the tripods. There's three of us, like Clark and Gaskin, are holding my ankles as I reach down, and then we all pull Gates up, and it took us like a half hour, and then we were like, all right, we'll just stay here, and we sent, I think, Robbie, because he was the last guy, we sent him back to get the ladder and come back, and then we, we crossed, but yeah, and, you know, it didn't look that bad, it, looked, it only looked like a foot of water, so okay, so Chris, Chris jumps in, and just, whoop, just sinks, I go, that was very deceiving. Dude, didn't uh, King and Gunny Franks almost drowned in a canal and sang in? Oh, that was on the one what? of our inserts and saying in. Yeah, it was the it, first one. It was. We were like getting Jake, close to the compound yeah, we were going to. I think Jake was telling me about that, and a gunny fell in. <laughs> he just like started flailing like a turtle on his back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching this all happen from a couple of guys back. It was a total trade wreck. Remember, there was nothing yeah, I could do. Gunny Frank came in just so pissed off. So yeah, I, I'm trying to remember because I don't. It wasn't very deep. Yeah. But I think he just tripped and fell. And Somebody and almost ended up like so whoever fell in with him like <laughs> fell face first and was like having just a lot up. of trouble. Yeah. yeah, I think King was like pinned under his rock, under his rock yeah. face for him. And he had, he was he was carrying the uh, the Barrett the, the fifty dollar yeah. thing. <laughs> and then yeah, Frank's like fell on his back, his rook on it, and Jake said he was like a like a turtle upside down in the just splashed in the creek. <laughs> and our rucks were so heavy; it's not like oh, any of us yeah. could jump into action to like. No. It Help was, him. Yeah, all the crap we were carrying would have been, yeah. yeah. If we were going to ambush on one of those movements, it would have been completely combat ineffective. Okay. Like when we left for Truck Now, again, that was the very first one, Truck Now, and we didn't know what to expect, so we had everything loaded. Oh, yeah. We weighed all of our rucks and just in our team, and the, our lightest ruck was, it was like 115 pounds. Yeah. The lightest one, you know. And what are you going to do when you're carrying that? Yeah. Nothing, you know? And, yeah, people... And some of those pounds were our, uh, you know, extra boots that we had to pack if we wanted to wear them. Yeah. That and our armored plates and stuff. Yeah. Or in addition to that, like, yeah. we had a lot of weight on our backs at deployment. I just think it's funny, looking through pictures, you see the progression of learning from Truck Now to 1 to, yeah. you know, the very last one I was saying, and just as far as gear that we carried and oh, stuff I had that like, we did. I just and, had, like, three mags. Yeah, and then... I think it's one of the things that sticks out is uh, there's a picture of me on the roof and truck now at one, you know, we filled sandbags and there's like two sandbags on top of each other. I'm just laying behind it, you know, and you, then you look at our singing picture and we have like a four bedroom castle of sandbags on top of the building, oh, yeah. you know, we, we, oh, yeah. <laughs> we got good at filling sandbags, which is mm -hmm. funny, you know, like oh, I always fill a couple sandbags and put a berm around it. And then, you know, a couple months later we got, it's a fortress of sandbags that you could, you know, work out in. Remember that ter <laughs> terrible outside the compound? monstrosity that was, we made that was stupid first of all for yeah. putting something there but yeah that, that was like probably a 10 foot wide barrier of same that was right a, again I, I won't mention his name but that was again it was a collective higher ups putting somebody in charge of something that they had no business in like Absolutely. making a decision in and, they and it put us at risk and when people luckily nobody died in that death trap yeah and when people express their concern about it they pretty much got told to shut up mm-hmm there's a, a really good book, if you haven't read it. It's called The Mission, The Men, and mm -hmm. Me. Have you read that? Yeah. By Pete Blaber. Incredible book that everyone should read. And that's written by an officer. And what his perspective is, is how every officer should think. Yeah. And one of his rules is listen to the guy on the ground. You know, because they have the best perspective. They have the best knowledge of what's going on. But so often, the guy in the office is the one making the decisions when it should be the guy on the ground that has the most input. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's a great book. And even in life in general, you know, his, his structure of, for those that don't know, the mission, the man and me, the way, whenever he made a decision, he he put it in like a, a hierarchy of what's best for the mission, what's best for the men, and lastly, what's best for me. It's like, so if I have to make a decision and it's best, you know, it's not so great for me, but it will get the mission accomplished, 
then we're going to go that way because mission's number one. You know, the men yeah. and, are before me and last. And so even in the workforce, you know, depending on whatever your job it is, you know, think of what's best for your end goal, what's best for your employees. And lastly, not firstly, lastly, should be what's best for you. Yeah. You know? And you'd be and, surprised how much good comes your way oh, when absolutely. you do it that way. And you know, I think if a lot of people operate that way and just in everyday business, everyday life in general, mm-hmm. I think there could be a lot more, a lot more, you know, productivity, effectiveness, less hostility in the workforce. Yeah. Better retention. Absolutely. But yeah. So let's, uh, <laughs> we, I could talk all day about bad higher ups. Oh yeah. And, I could talk all week. Um, Let's uh, let's talk about the latest TBI news that's coming out. Um, well, news. Let's let me set this one up. We this morning I watched the White House press briefing as I normally do because it's an interesting way to see what both sides are saying mm-hmm. instead of just hearing like what you know conservative libertarian Correct. news is saying. I'm seeing. The questions that the, it's actually a bunch of liberal reporters usually getting the questions, but you have like the presidency's side, like answering them. And it's kind of like this argument. Um, So it's interesting to watch because you kind of see how they're building narratives in this briefing Mm -hmm. that you would see on the news later. And you like, you can see through a lot of the bullshit, but anyways, um, I just noticed, like, uh, the White House brief will, briefer will come out. Um, it's a uh, Sean Spicerman, and he he'll usually go through like what's coming up, like things the administration's working on, you know, achievements, stuff like that. And he started hailing something this morning about them having a big VA symposium type deal up at Harvard or something, and. It's basically to bring all these researchers and stuff, and then he specifically mentioned traumatic brain injury. So then I'm like, okay, I want to find out Spiked your interest a little more. What's, what this current administration is willing to do to help the guys that have been neglected for so long or written off, and myself and you being included in that. And so I read up on it, and I get brings me to so I google it I found the event website I look at the schedule and like what they're planning on doing and it ends up being a list of you know there's a lot of emphasis on PTSD people link that together all all too often yeah as in they're one one in the same like basically mild traumatic brain injury like is PTSD you, like you have PTSD if you have a mild traumatic brain injury? Like they go they hand in hand, automatically link it together. Yeah, yeah. which isn't always the case. <laughs> it reminds me of I, know I told you that story when uh, I crashed during my motocross race and the mm-hmm. paramedic guy. Did I tell you about that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's a funny story you should tell. <laughs> it was uh, during one of my motocross races after I got out, and uh, I, I had a I had a bad crash and. Um, I ended up just uh, smashing my shoulder to pieces and uh, I got knocked unconscious and stuff. And I remember um, being at the VA and they were saying, hey, if you ever have a bad injury and an ambulance comes up to you, make sure you tell them you've had a TBI so that they know, you know, if you had another hit on your head, they need to be cautious. And so, you know, as I get, I I crash, I ended up getting a plate and screws in my shoulder and whatnot. So the, the paramedic that was on staff, not the ambulance driver, a paramedic on staff, you know, comes running up to me, and uh, you know, I take my helmet off. I'm like, yeah, my shoulders, or my, I'm like, first of all, I tell him, like, yeah, my collarbone's definitely broken. He's like, how do you know? I tell him, I've broken it three times. I can, I know it's broken. And so he's like, okay. So he gets down on a knee and leans on my shoulder. That's broken. I'm like, I just fucking told you it's broken. So anyways, uh, and uh, so they call the paramedics, and I was like, hey, I'm just letting you know. Uh, my doctor told me to tell you that I've had a TBI before, yeah. and I know I just got rocked in the head pretty hard, so just let you know. He's like, okay, okay, thanks for letting me know. And so then, you know, a couple minutes later, the um, 
now I think the fire truck shows up or not. I don't think it was a fire truck. I don't know, another paramedic or someone. And so they show up and he's like, yeah, this guy, you know, he's got a broke collarbone and just let you know, he has PTSD. I'm like, no, 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 no. I told you I've had a, a TBI. Not, and I don't have PTSD. Yeah. I've had a TBI before a traumatic brain injury. I, you know, gotten blown up and whatnot. He's like, okay, okay. <laughs> and then after, uh, and they have to cut, they cut my jersey off. I had my hawk's tooth on. Yeah. And he's like, oh, look, whoa. I was like, whoa, what's that? Is that bullet? Uh, was that a bullet? I'm like, yeah, you get up when you graduate sniper school. Uh, one, one of the firefighters asked me. So then the paramedics come up in the ambulance and uh, the guy's giving <laughs> assessing and letting them know what happened. He's like, all right, this guy, you know, got hit, uh, got hit in the head with the shoulder, yeah, but be careful, he has PTSD. I'm like, I don't have fucking PTSD. What's your problem? You know, <laughs> which didn't help my cause. Or who, like, that didn't help my cause. Oh, he's definitely, he's PTSD. Yeah, I know. Right? So like, that didn't help my cause. And then, yeah. so the paramedics come and they cut my, they cut my jersey off and I have my dog's tooth on. <laughs> that same fucking guy, he's like, um, I told him, like, yeah, it's the bullet I give to you when you graduate sniper school. He's like, is that the bullet you got shot with that gave you PTSD? <laughs> I'm like, what, what are you so wrapped around at? Yeah, I never once mentioned it. He automatically just yeah. gave that, uh, you know, notion that I have PTSD because I've been blown up in Afghanistan. Or It's just that automatic, they hear it on the news or they hear yeah. it somewhere, and automatically they hear, oh, boom, veteran, it's wounded veteran, PTSD. Such, such an abused term. And such an abused diagnosis. It is. It's there's so many people that give it a bad name, oh a bad gosh. rep, give it a stigma, and so many people. It's yeah. It's I mean, just how much. Many, of, how many people are? There's a lot of si- it sensitive, sensitive flowers yeah, out there. It can't be unproven. Yeah. So how so many people claim it to get the free benefits? That which is ridiculous because yeah, some dudes like have bad problems with it. Yeah, and like they've. They've actually, you know, and it does depend on person to person, I will Correct. say. But there's also mer- various yeah. forms of PTSD, yeah. you know. I mean, everyone has it of some sort. It could yeah. be mild or severe or, you know, just small stuff but, that uh, you may not even notice day to day. But, I mean, everyone has a PTSD of some sort if you go through uh, an experience like that. But some people have severe, severe trauma and some of us... Or some people can, you know, get through life without any problems, but so many just claim it at the drop of a hat yeah. because, boom, can't be disproved. You were in the military, okay, so you have PTSD. Here's your and people free are money encouraged play. to just yes. say, say they have it, yeah. Okay. Even if that they don't, they're like, oh no, you, you'll go to the VA, and people are saying, oh, have you got your PTSD pay yet? Yeah. It's like, what the fuck is going on, you know? But people I think look at it as a free paycheck. Not as something that can actually be used for people that actually need the help and assistance. And <coughs> it's, I think the bad thing is people get their minds so wrapped around it. And it's almost bad that we call, I run into problems telling people, like like you did, exactly. It's a perfect example of telling somebody, I've had a traumatic brain injury, which should clue a medical provider in or a firefighter to think, okay, this guy's had, like, a concussion, probably from, like, a blast wave or something, right? You would think. But that's the problem is we're linked, we're, com- we're, we have a chain, two chain links. One is PTSD, one is TBI, and we've, the metal community has linked them together. Like, they're inseparable. And that you can't have one and, without the other, too. And yeah. that PTSD is, TBI like, without PTSD. is, like, yeah more solidified because oh they've done a bunch of research about it and know so much about it except that you know they misdiagnose people all the time with it so it's way overdiagnosed in my opinion completely overdiagnosed and so then you have this term post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress whatever you want syndrome whatever you want to call it but the fact that the word traumatic is in it right and then I'm trying to explain to somebody, I've had a traumatic brain injury. I think that's the key. The traumatic the, word. The traumatic yeah. word in their brain. And that's why they That's why they look at you. You can see them physically change the way they look at you. They're like, this guy has PTSD. He's crazy. They think emotional, you know, mental behavior, behavioral disorder instead of physical brain damage. damage yeah. You know? And so I've actually... I've been playing around with a bunch of different terms and like when I describe people like when there's a necessary time for me to say it, you know, um, 
is I, I say that I've had blast wave concussions. And I use that term because it's different than sports concussions. If you tell somebody you have, oh, I've had concussions, they immediately think football. Yeah. Or, or, or you say that and, yeah. people, and people are like, oh, yeah, if I had concussions playing football or riding a bike or this and that. But there's a difference between a concussion yeah. from hitting your head, you know, because that happens too when you get blown up. But also, I mean, when, when a charge goes off, there's an actual blast wave that ripples through the air. Mm-hmm. And that wave going through your brain, that does damage. And so it's not just the yeah. knock on your head, but the actually the, the, the force of the blast wave going through can, you know, scramble yeah. the tissue in there. And you you can not even not even hit your head on anything and get more damage just from the the pressure going through you. Exactly, and I think that's the big misstep within the medical community, which how we talk about it. Oh, and that's and not even ever mentioned, you know, as far as you know, between the gray matter of your brain, and, you know, the damage from the blast wave. People just related to well hitting your head on something. The big disservice they've done to tons of veterans because this is a very common. Occurrence. A lot of guys have been exposed to blasts repeatedly over and over again for multiple deployments. And it actually comes from training. So it's actually very prevalent in like infantry and um, especially like more special units where every guy, you know, you're not just a mortar team. Mm-hmm. Like, like you're just shooting mortars or whatever. Like you're trained up on mortars, rockets like everything and you're going doing all your workup training you're you're using all of these then you're also doing shooting packages where you're doing breaches and all this stuff you're also probably an airborne jumper and maybe having some hard plfs where you're getting more of the like sports (laughs) related you know the sports related head head knock on the ground or whatever and it all adds up but specifically the blast wave from like the training aspect and then you go on deployment and then you're around these blast waves from explosions coming in, you may not hit, get hit with shrapnel, but that blast wave still hits you, rocks yeah. your brain. And in training, there's always, you know, one of those barriers for safety precautions set up anytime you're in training, you know, either a solid barrier or a distance barrier. And so those are always set in place while you're in training. But when you're, so you can still obtain it, absolutely. But uh, yeah, overseas, all that safety is out the window because you're doing whatever you have to do. So if you have to be five feet from the blast on the other side of the wall, so be it. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're protected from any shrapnel or anything, but that wave goes straight through and yeah. it, it'll knock you on your ass. You know? So, um, the, one of the, one of the big problems I have is doctors will take their misunderstanding or their lack of education when it comes to blast wave concussions, because that's what I'm just going to start calling it instead of TBI. Replace TBI with blast wave concussions. Their lack of understanding of blast wave concussions and what it does to the brain. It's a BWC now. They use PTSD as a crutch. Oh, and absolutely. And they do, they fuck guys over so bad by saying there's there's actually no physical damage done with your brain because your brain heals after concussions. You know, sports injuries have you know, taught us that. And so you're just dealing with PTSD. You just have an emotional disorder that can be healed, right? Through therapy or whatnot. And so that's terrible to say that to somebody. It's like telling somebody that has cancer, like stage four cancer, that they have, you know, uh, an abrasion that's going to sure. heal, right? It's going to be okay. Or that they have an emotional disorder. Like it's not the cancer that's eating your brain. It's it's actually just in your head. So like <laughs> for guys that have TBIs, a lot of the symptoms are like ongoing migraines, like seizure type activity and stuff like that. And when you feel when you're when unfortunately guys that don't have medical knowledge can feel like these creepy crawler insects in my brain that are causing these migraines or whatever is all in my head and it's an emotional disorder but it's not it's an actual physical thing that's actually happening and it's just guys getting that knowledge can be so comforting and at least they can like put their finger on it and say okay at least i have this and i can work around it it's not in not keep going down that road rather than not knowing what it is and still going down a false road and treating it like PTSD and then you're getting all the 
the uh, the psych drugs that come with the PTSD treatment route, which is straight up killing guys. Straight up. I, th- I, I am convinced that guys with TBI that have been misdiagnosed with PTSD and are put on all these psych drugs, which a lot of them, by the way, uh, have, you know, suicide as one of the side effects. Of course. Are committing suicide because they get they get stuck in hopeless thinking, you know what? I can't This is this, this is these drugs that are supposed to be helping me. This is in my head and, and I can't do anything about it and you know what? Fuck it. Like I can do something about it. I can end this fucking headache mm-hmm. that apparently is just in my mind. And then they fucking handle it. And if they only knew that it's not that. It's you actually had physical damage done to your brain. There's been a study done. New York's Time article came out about it probably a year ago, which is why I'm so frustrated that we're still not talking about this right now with the latest advancements getting announced by the White House and the VA and all this stuff. Is there is they're starting to discover that there's this fine dust pattern of scar tissue between the gray and white matter in your brain specifically from blast wave concussions, not something that necessarily comes from a sports related concussion. And they're actually doing this research to bring back honor to the guys in World war one who were, uh, you know, told they had shell shock and mm-hmm. guys were like executed for deserting their positions cause they were confused and shit like that. So, and if you think about world war one, it's just that, you know, they might not have gotten the shrapnel or whatever from those huge artillery shells, but they're constantly getting hit. Pounded, oh, sure. pounded, pounded, pounded by that, by the blast wave. And it does something to your brain. And that's what I don't get is these doctors don't have common sense. You're sitting here, a neurologist. I'm speaking from my own personal experience right now. I'm sitting across from a neurologist in her office. And these neurologists will say that Oh, it hasn't been proven to do anything to you. You should be healed up. Your brain should heal by now. With no way of knowing if that's the case, right? (laughs) They can't see inside your brain. And it's just their lack of common sense and knowledge to think that an overpressure blast wave just goes through your head. No problem. No problem. You know, and they're actually like starting to like research what it actually has effect on like specific blood, like blood vessels and stuff like that even. But it's, it's super frustrating to go through that process. And I feel lucky because I was a medic and I can, I could tell what was going on in my head and what medicine has taught me and what the doctors are saying is not adding up. No. And I don't know how much of it do you think is. Some of these doctors may think that could be the case, but that'll just open up a whole can of worms for 100 years back that they just don't want to open up, you know, and all this could have been, you know, misdiagnosed, you know, um, malpractice and what have you, and they just don't want to open that up. Well, I would say you've run into problems when there's a bureaucracy, when the government's running anything. You've created a program where... People can get PTSD like that. They can get a rate of 100% uh, disability retirement from the VA. The guys flying drones in Vegas are getting PTSD for flying the drones that are overseas because they have to see hard pictures on their screens. You know, and you're so in an air-conditioned and office and going to the casino that night. You know, <laughs> They're getting compensated more. I, I've seen guys getting, they get, a lot of those guys get 100%. If you just you have some nightmares or whatever, you know, you walk around in public and you're scared, hundred percent. And meanwhile, you have a vast majority of people, not a vast majority, but like you have a lot of people walking around with actual physical brain damage, and undiagnosed, and it's not getting recognized. Or if it is, because you, you know you consistently complain of the headaches and everything, and it gets documented, they're rating like thirty, forty percent for that. So for physical brain damage that, you know, because we have no way of healing it right now and it's not even fully studied, we're going to 
rate you for physical brain damage for the rest of your life for 30, 40%. But we'll give but this guy 100% for... For an emotional disorder. Supposed emotional disorder. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a, and, fl- it's a flawed system. And so why I am so firing mad right now... You look firing mad. ...is because this meeting they're about to have... I looked at the schedule, and it's a lot of talk about PTSD and what we're doing with that, and a lot of talk from the sports concussions. They have one of the keynote speakers that they're raving about is this lady that wrote you know, a book or article that that movie came out about um, the concussions in football. It's called Concussion. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the previews for that? I have. That preview pissed me the fuck off. Well, I mean that in boxing too. They yeah. take the head, but in in that in that preview, it's a completely they, different they're like concussion. The doctor, you know, played by Will Smith, he's like, "These are our heroes. We have to take care of our American heroes." Talking about fucking NFL football players, who gives a fuck? Like they're getting paid millions upon millions of dollars to bang their heads against each other, mm-hmm. right? Meanwhile, a little E E three private or whatever is getting paid next to nothing to go get exposed over and over again to blast. Like that's that's a bad argument. But the point is they're trying to compare the two. And let's focus on the real American heroes, the people that have actually gone and fought the war and actually take care of them because that's what this whole meeting is supposed to fucking be yeah. about. But yeah, we're still talking about NFL yeah. football players. The arguments I hear, which is a sorry argument, they're saying, you know, well, these kids volunteer to go overseas and, you know, if they get blown up, they know that's part of the job. Okay, well, these kids volunteer to play football. If they get hit in the yeah. head, they know it's part of the job. Well, what's the difference, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually glad that they're, they're getting it, the that address with them too, you know, because it's, it's important as far as like from a health healthcare standpoint, oh, sure. that those people are taken care of and we recognize what it is and research it and see what we can do to prevent it or, you know, to treat it. Like how do we, how do we make it better after the fact? And, you know, through research and to, um, like CRISPR and all this other stuff they're coming up with, um, where maybe you could, re you know redo those pathways in the brain you know mm-hmm. open them back up and so the 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 so so I get it like let's let's take care of the NFL guys but let's let's be careful calling them heroes okay and let's let's stop talking about taking care of the veterans and actually do it and actually fucking do it you know, people are so separated from the wars we're fighting in since World War II. And I think I've talked about this and, you know, an nauseum in my first couple podcasts. But people have no attachment to it. Majority of Congress has no no skin in the game when it comes, it comes to these wars. So they're not seeing the aftermath firsthand. The families of these veterans mm-hmm. are often the first people that notice uh, the symptoms of TBI are your loved ones, like your your spouse or your girlfriend, or you know, sure. And it's it's a shame that we're still this this study came out a year ago, saying that there's actually physical damage, and yet guys are still getting pushed down into this PTSD route and put on fucking drugs, and it's not necessarily necessary. Yeah. I say explore both, but don't just shoot somebody down this route just because that's just because you don't understand blast wave concussions in TBI. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. That's like saying, you know, the the rest of our universe that we haven't been to it doesn't exist because we haven't explored it yet. Mm-hmm. You know, except we have. <laughs> except we have, except there are studies coming out, except we can see parts of the, you know, universe. Like, wake up and start, you know, stop being stagnant in medicine and just pressing the fucking easy button or the pharmaceutical button. That should be, 
a fucking crime. Well, anymore, everyone turns to pills before anything. It's, all the pills that the VA gave me for my migraines, they just, they don't help. They make other symptoms worse, you know? Yeah. And as we as, as we said, you know, I I tell the VA when I go there, you know, my migraines are getting worse. You know, some things trigger them, or no one thing triggers them, but I, I can... Uh, I can feel when they're coming on, and the medicine that they give me just makes me almost, you know, more sick and feel worse than a migraine does. So what's the point of taking it? You know? Yeah, there is and, no point. Yeah. Because they haven't even fully studied that medication. Yeah. And so their thing is, I was like, okay, well, what can you guys do? Can you at least, you know, look at my brain again and see if there's anything? I say, oh, we can give you an MRI, but we have to give you an EKG to make sure your heart can handle it. Well, I'm like, okay, so they give you an EKG, and it's been six months now. Oh, we still don't have the results. I'm like, I, I'm sure you have the results in about, you know, five minutes of that. An know, EKG so. is immediate. You yeah. have those results immediately. So it's just them just putting people off and off and off and off, you know. I mean, the EKG present, pr- like, prints it out right there. It says, like, normal EKG, and if there's anything wrong, you can redo it, well, like, right. on the spot, yeah. which is bullshit. And that's, okay, so... For instance, my my first experience with the VA therapist down in Dallas at the Denton location there, they it was a nurse practitioner, and I sit down with her, and I'm telling her the issues that I'm dealing with related to my TBI. And it's like the memory issues, mm-hmm. the migraines, all this stuff telling her the stuff I'm having trouble forgetting to do like I'll forget to brush my teeth I'll forget to you know do these like basic things that I have to get reminded by to do like by Christina she has to remind me to do these things or I have to like write down checklists and stuff and have it like on the mirror you know there's all these like compensatory things I have to do to like remember to do things and I still forget and she's like okay well what do you plan on doing and I'm like well I'm looking at applying to go to you know go to school and she starts hysterically laughing at me in this appointment right like my first me- mental health like <laughs> therapy appointment i'm like okay i'll give the va a shot i'll give this a shot i'll see if like at least since i can't do anything to heal my t you know, my blast wave concussion right now at least i'll learn how to like cope with it sure. you know and instead i get laughed at and she thought it was hysterical and through her laughter she was like <laughs> how do you expect to go back to school if you can't even remember to brush your teeth wow and luckily i had just gone through the cerebrum center treatment program and it had dialed back my um my reactionary like processing cuz part of the tbi is like a lot of people deal with um, with uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Being uh, heightened or aggravated easily. Mm-hmm. Um, what what is the term I'm looking for? Um, but anyways, luckily that had been like the cerebrum center actually did a good job of treating the vestibular issues I was dealing with, which is a whole other ball game, mm-hmm. and for whatever reason coming out of there I'd been dialed back but I just like I decided to like finish out the thing and just kind of like so I started asking her like do you know like about TBI and like the people you know the symptoms of it and and she's like of course I've been with the VA for 20 years that was her answer mm-hmm. and like have you studied like any of the recent stuff that's coming out about being with like the VA doesn't, and doesn't she goes, you understand that was, what's happening there. That was her answer. It was like, oh, I've been with the VA for 20 years, so I think I got it. It's like, that didn't answer the question. You're just, you're just telling me you've been here forever and you can do whatever the fuck you want yeah. because it's a bureaucratic, you know, program. And it's, and at the end of it, she was getting frustrated that I was, you know, challenging her, her, medical authority or whatever or fucking vast medical knowledge and she was like okay well um she had started out the conversation i forgot this um that she started out the whole appointment by saying what do you want i was like um well 
this is my first appointment, so I figured we'd like maybe go over history, like what's going on. And she's like, okay, hold on, let me, <sighs> okay. And she like doesn't say anything else to me and proceeds to read my chart for like 15 minutes <laughs> while we're sitting there in the appointment, right? Something she maybe should have looked over You'd think so. beforehand. And she just acts like it was the worst thing in the world that she had to do that. And then she turns to me and she's like, okay, so what are you dealing with? That's when I talked about the memory stuff and mm -hmm. all that. And she started laughing at me. And then I go, okay, well. And then she was like, okay, well, all right, so what do you want? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, to get treated for yeah, what like, I need. What, what, what are your thoughts? And she's like, okay, well, I'm going to give you this, you know, this drug or whatever. And it's going to help. It's going to help with everything you got going on. That's literally what she said. This is going to help you with everything you got going on. And I was like, being a special operations medic, I had studied a lot of, you know, we have to know all these drugs, mm -hmm. a lot of drugs. And I knew what this drug was. I was like, wait a second. Let's say antidepressant. I was like, why are you giving me an antidepressant? She's like, because it's, you know, it's it's going to help you with your your migraines. It's going to help you with everything. Like, basically, she just wanted to give me something and get me just out of there. Just to get you out of there. I'm like, one of the first list of side effects on that is suicide. <laughs> of course, yeah. Suicidal tendencies is, like, literally the first list of side effects. I'm like, and she's like, oh, well, you know, they just have to put those things on. I'm like, first of all, I don't need that. Was this in Dallas? I was like, I'm not going to take that. And... Yeah, this is in Dallas, but at their Denton location. Okay. I've had bad experiences at the Dallas location, too, so they don't get off easy either. <laughs> but, and I'm not saying every VA is this bad. No, it depends where you go after. It does depend where you really go. Really good ones and but really bad is, ones. But there is, I've been to enough places from being treated in the military medical system and out of it. I've been to enough places, been around enough doctors, seeing that they're still meeting and talking about PTSD and not blast wave concussion. And to know that it's a culture issue mm -hmm. and there's something about it. You know, we can go the whole conspiracy theory route and be like, you know, it is, it's a big money deal for them where if you start recognizing people might have permanent brain damage, which is what the science mm -hmm. is saying, then you have to compensate them more for that permanent brain damage. And you right? have to go who knows how far back. Exactly. You know? And that's a lot of work and they probably don't want to do. And it's not treatable now. So instead of focusing on maybe, I don't know, developing Being a able treat to treat it. Yeah. They just, just gonna ignore it. Pass it off as PTSD until and, ho no one, and, and hope you kill hoping, yourself hoping before no they have to better, you know? do anything about it. Not to uh, shy away from this, um, but you're talking about um, watching the, the White House correspondence today. Mm -hmm. um, what I want, do want to get to, we, don't, we can go back to your TBI is uh, the media these days, speaking of which. Yeah. At what point, I mean, you should be able to watch the news to get an understanding of what's going on. At what point does the media try and brainwash you into what you should think? Like, I have to watch CNN, Fox News, and NBC, watch all three of them, get three completely different stories, and put it all together to try and get a gist of what's going on. Then, you, know, you, at have, what then point, you have to check independent sources absolutely, too. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, I mean, they, the media should do just that: report the news, not tell you what you should think about the news. Yeah. And so many people just fall into that, and that's where you get so divided. Like, it's unreal. I just want to know what's going on in the world. I don't want you to tell me your opinion. I want to know facts. Yeah. I don't want you to tell me what you think I should feel or what you think I should be doing. Tell me what the hell is going that's, on. Is that too much to ask for? That's that's the big problem. Is we have it's a poison this, in the society. These they're elitist, and they they literally think in their mind that you're too dumb to figure things out for yourself. So I'm gonna tell you to they, think how I think. Yeah, you just need to understand how I understand things, mm -hmm. and that's why they're all pushing an agenda, and that's. The the news anchors are just literally puppet oh, mouths sure. for the people pulling pulling the strings. Absolutely, and they aren't reporting the news. It isn't news. No, it's not. It's bullshit. <laughs> it's big steaming piles of shit. 
being force fed down our throats. It's playing on, I mean, it's like people don't even necessarily want to watch it, but what plays in like public places on the TV? CNN, exactly. Fox News, depending on who owns the place, and like in it, where you're gender, at, like where what you're region at. you're in. Yeah. I'm, and I it's just know. there. It's yeah. like they, they just, it, it, it seems like most of their audience yeah. is fabricated saw, because yeah. people are just forced to be in proximity to Listen, it. I saw this article. I didn't verify the uh, validity of it, but it was written by a very you know, valid and well known source. And it had two pictures of newspaper of the Wall Street Journal when Trump went to Mexico and talked to the president there. One, where both pictures, both were front front page newspapers, had the exact same picture on it of Trump and the president. One headline, and the read, um, "Trump and Mexico president come to terms on wall." And the whole art on, was a whole article on that. The exact same newspaper, exact same picture, read, "Trump, um, Trump is a tough guy on the Mexican wall to the president or something like that." Yeah. And then the article was all about how Trump was, you know, back to Mr. Tough to it. The exact same newspaper, exact same picture, exact same day. And they just distributed the, each newspaper depending on the region of where that region stood. Yeah. That's bullshit. Why not? You know? That's, they're, they're, I think I think people are waking up to that, though. And now they just... I don't watch the news anymore. And you no. know what? I'm so much... Less stress. Yeah. Know, okay, I never got stressed from the news. I just got angry from watching the news. Yeah. Like I said, we had to watch NBC and then watch Fox. It's the exact. They play the exact same stories, just yeah. from their side of view. You know, their their side of videos. You know, one will show one video, the other show another video, the exact same thing, but from a different side. It's like, why not just show exactly what happened? Show it from start to finish. Don't show it halfway through yeah. where you see a cop beating a kid up. Why don't you show the kid pulling a gun on a cop first? You know, but so many people will say, oh, well, the cop beat this kid up burn them well why don't you see what happened first you that's, know that's that's i don't even, so many don't, people just they all of a sudden become automatic professional you know readers of the situation without knowing the facts and then that just feeds off and feeds off and feeds off someone feeds off that and yeah. then just snowballs before anyone knows what really happened i can't agree with you more the media is just a it's a, a cancer i've taken it so far i don't the only time I watch the media is to remind myself how foolish they are. Yeah, <laughs> and so I'm never going to them for actual news because it's all it's it's fake. No, it's just bullshit. And so what I do is if I want to know what happened on a certain event that maybe comes up in the news, right? I go to YouTube and I search a bunch of different like live accounts, like mm-hmm. let's say a shooting or something, or some incidents that comes up. I'll go and find. Somebody has the full video of what happened, sure. and I'll take my own analysis from what I see. I don't need some, you know, reporter that has seen the video and they're like, "Hey, trust us. We'll just give you the analysis yeah. of what happened." No, I'm educated enough, well versed in a lot of different topics. I can make my own decision. Correct. Tell me the facts. What, what and happened? Let me formulate yeah. my own opinion. Exactly. But. Yeah, I mean, that, you shouldn't have to go through five different sources and spend an hour looking for videos that may or may not exist to understand what happened, you know? Yeah. it's And it's getting worse and worse, and that's just dividing everyone more and more yeah. on a daily basis. Well, I mean, it's it's just like what we're doing right now. Like, we are literally combating fake news right now, talking about TBI mm-hmm. and blast wave concussion, because everybody's hearing on the news is PTSD and... Football concussions, that they're the same as TBI. Mm-hmm. And so we're so presenting the facts. Someone of hears what, that, all of a sudden that's yeah. a fact, you know, mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily the case. And it's uh, it's just, it's, it's super frustrating to know that they're, they're having this, and this is going to be their big push to, you know, help the veterans, right? <laughs> But instead, they're doing them a huge disservice. Yes, take care of the people that really have PTSD. But do it in the but, right way. But, yeah, do it in the right way. And don't push everybody into that corner. It's it's so frustrating. And, um, I mean, that goes back to, I'll say... The, the current drugs we're using, the pharmaceuticals, are not working. And they need to start exploring alternative means. And 
I'll go ahead and say it. I take CBD oil for my migraines, and it completely wipes it out. And this is not me smoking pot or anything. I never did that before. But finally, it made sense to me. And that's the problem is they're not talking to the guys who have a blast wave concussions. Like, I get it. They have their, like, token veteran that's speaking mm-hmm. at this event. Guess what? A bomb went off. He's a ranger, and he took shrapnel into his, like, head, into his skull. He's got a huge, like, you know, scar on the side of his face. I get it. Like, that, you know, much props to that dude for living through that and, oh, like, sure. going on and all that stuff. But th- we're still talking about an impact mm-hmm. concussion, like from shrapnel, which is different than like he still probably had a blast wave concussion. But what we're talking about is long term, repeated exposure to blast waves, sure. over and, and, and over. the scar tissue that builds up from that. Yes, your brain might be able to take one or two in training, you know, but over time, that constant boom, 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 boom blast waves just hitting your brain it's causing something and we know it now Mm -hmm. and it needs to start being addressed i concur it's uh you know going through breachers course and whatnot when you're setting off demolitions in a house one one of their uh necessarily pre-check before we set off a charge is make sure your mouth is closed Mm -hmm. the pressure can't go through your mouth so clearly there's pressures they're acknowledging that even in the curriculum. Yeah. You but know. even if you have your mouth closed, so it can go through exactly. nasal passages. Exactly. Right? That's, that's what's funny. Yeah. And the interest, oh, this is what I want to mention and get on the record, is I went and saw, so I was getting told by this neurologist to basically, hey, it's all in your head, you're full of shit, you know? And I'm like, no, you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get a second opinion. Um, Cause she was basically telling me to go pound sand. Like you don't need to be treated. And luckily I stood up for myself and was like, Hey, I'm going to go see somebody else. I want a second opinion, which I got a lot of flack for. And I went down to San Diego down to Balboa and saw this doctor down there, this neurologist named Dr. Duckworth. And I think he's either out now or maybe stationed in Japan, but he'd done some independent research. Former Marine tanker, was dealing with TBI issues himself, became a neurologist after being a, a tanker. And I think he was in the Gulf or something, or uh, maybe in the beginning of Iraq. But he got out, became a neurologist, and he did a study with the SEALs training out in the desert in California. And the thing he noticed was the wives of the guys running the training were the ones reporting about their husbands starting to have these issues. And a lot, of, a lot of the first signs for anybody that's like maybe thinking your loved one has it or whatever, a lot of the first signs is you're just noting, noticing them change emo- like as a person. A lot of it's like their, their demeanor. They start becoming numb and stuff and um, maybe reactive, not being able to like clearly – see situations for what they are and stuff like that, like having trouble reading the situation. And then speech can be an early one, like mm-hmm. kind of like tripping over your words. I had that really bad. I and then it seemed do. like that was like an early symptom and then it kind of like went away. See, mine's but then like the migraines more, got worse. Yeah. My, uh, a lot of it's for, yeah, forgetfulness or also I'll be, you know, talking just completely lose my train of thought or yeah, stumbling over words is, is big and that's gotten... I'm glad it's gotten better for you. It's gotten continuously worse for me. Mm. But the migraines have gotten a lot worse for me. Yeah. So it's And that's the thing. It's weird. It's different for everybody. And right. that's why it's important to get a detailed history. Yeah. Not just a, a blanket diagnosis yeah. of everyone, you know. Cause Cause each- kind of like you telling those, those uh, first responders, hey, you know, I've been told I need to tell you that I have TBI. Mm-hmm. Us as medical providers, we're told like, Pounded it just like get a detailed medical history, mm-hmm. right? That's very important. So you can rule out all the other like possibilities of what things can be. That's why a lot of things get misdiagnosed because 
they don't get the proper history. It's like why Ebola and stuff like that <laughs> spreads in the United States because they don't ask, hey, have you traveled recently? Yeah. And now you notice if you go to the doctor after that whole Ebola scare, like people ask, like, have you traveled recently? It's part of the medical history. And yet it seems like we compact these medical visits into this time slot and, hey, we don't have time for the medical history. But yet for TBI, it's so important. It's important to find out if they were a breacher, if you've done this rocket training, if you've been mortars, like if how many deployments you've had, think back all the way through and think of the blast exposures you've had and get them documented. But they, because they don't take the time for that. No, they don't. They don't. And they they act like you're just like the boring and they have no knowledge. Here's Here's how much they don't know about blast wave concussions is you try and tell them specifically which blast waves you're exposed to because they're different, right? Mm -hmm. Getting hit by an artillery shell as opposed to, you know, a firecracker. You know, the little blast wave that comes from a firecracker that shoots out like maybe, you know, I don't know, a foot or something is completely different than a 105 shell. Mm -hmm. And the level of force, we're talking about like pounds, you know, the the PSI of that overpressure wave that's passing through you is different. And so something interesting Dr. Duckworth had was the overpressure of an RPG backblast. And you could actually see in color mm -hmm. form the different levels of like, oh, you know, of pressure. And he started a study where he put blast gauges on the instructors um, who were doing rocket, the, the SEALs were, it's basically in their uh, SQT training. So they're mm -hmm. doing like a lot of shooting and they'll shoot rockets and all mm -hmm. this stuff to familiarize themselves with that. Well, the students seem to be fine because they're shooting a rocket and then they're moving to their next part of training, right? Well, the guys who were out there at the range constantly. They're exposed to it day yeah, in, day out. So. And it, they're not standing behind the rocket. They're standing in the safe spot next to it, right? The safe spot, quote unquote. But they're still boom, boom. Boom, boom, repetitive. That's the key. It's repetitive mm -hmm. exposure to like small blast, big blast. It doesn't matter. It's repetitive exposure. Sure. They started noticing that these these blasts, these little uh, gauges were reading like pretty bad overpressure just from mm -hmm. being around it. So even the whole system we have of now, granted, we still need to be able to use these things, right? We still need to be able to run breaches. We still need to be able to do all this stuff. But we're not considering. We're just writing off that these don't have an effect. Because sure. we're told that, right? We're told minimum safe distance, okay. right? Yeah. So, hey, as long as you're in the minimum safe you're distance, safe. Yeah. then there should be no damage, right? But that's actually false. You actually are still getting a oh, blast absolutely. wave exposure. And it's cumulative. It's happening over time. Yeah. And it also just goes to show you that you know these instructors... They could have, you know, say instructor A may have never deployed before, but he's mm -hmm. been, you know, four years subject, you know, subjected to these blasts day in and day out. Goes in, gets, uh, you know, diagnosed with TBI. Boom, often that's he has PTSD as well because he has TBI. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, um, but medical professionals are lazy, and they need to get on the medical history when it comes to blast wave concussions. And they need to they need to study. Okay, if here's my thing. Maybe if you're maybe if you're an ER doc, right? Or something like that, you don't need to know the difference between an RPG and, you know, and sixty pound HME blast sure. from, from an IED. Military doctors need to know the Absolutely. difference. When I'm ta talking to a neurologist about my blast wave concussions and she has no idea the difference between a recoilless rifle round and an UGL, like under grenade launcher, 40 mic mic round, that's a problem. You're talking to the wrong person. Yeah, because they, no, they have no frame of reference. No. They have no perspective on the intensity of that blast and how resilient we are. That's that's probably one of the big contributing factors as well 
is you've asked a bunch of badass people to do extraordinary things, mm -hmm. right? And so where some people, I mean, it's it, look at like UFC, right? Or fighting. Some people have what they call tough jaws or mm -hmm. whatever. Some people can take a hit better than what other people, whatever sure. it is, genes, you know, how you're, how you're raised, how you train, all that stuff accumulates to, you know, how well you can take a hit. It's also cumulative. So somebody who might have been able to really take a lot of hits, all of a sudden they've hit their expiration date. Mm -hmm. and now they can't take hits at all, right? They're actually really weak at taking hits. And that's kind of how it is for us. They think we're lying about the hits we're taking <laughs> because they can't wrap their head around how somebody could survive something like this. Correct. Well, I got news for you. The human body is super resilient. At least it tries, mm -hmm. you know? And so we're able, we're, we're able to survive some insurmountable blasts. And that doesn't belittle it, you know? And, and that's, that's the problem is they think because you're able to sit there. And something I found is going from medical appointment to medical appointment, I, and being a medical professional, I knew all, all the things that were wrong with me. And I could list them off. And so it's something I was doing every appointment. I was trying to hammer in the medical history to him, right? I was like, you need to know this. And so when you say that over and over again, it's something you've, you're saying mm -hmm. in, in almost you know twice a week. So it's something you're regularly saying. So they're taking your interaction with them, saying something you've said multiple times a week over and over and over again as you being fine and able to talk to someone well. No, the trouble with speech is when you're talking with somebody in a normal situation and you're having to develop thoughts. It's that, that cognition of being able to like grab mm -hmm. sentences and develop them and like talk about a certain topic as opposed to listing off things you've listed off time and time again. And so in their history, they're like, well, see, he seemed normal to me, so fuck it. There's nothing wrong with him. And that's a big problem. Yeah, I think that's a, a very valid evaluation. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, at the same time, these physicians see people come through at the cyclic rate. Some have absolutely, you know, a big problem, and some clearly don't. And I'm, it may just be easier just to pass them all through. Okay, 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 okay. Here's your medicine, here's your medicine. Check, check, check. And, you know, see you later kind of thing. You know, but, I mean... Just trying to get an appointment with a VA, you're weeks to months out. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, these people are also going through the cyclic rate of of patients coming through their window or coming through their door, you know. Wow. And it's, so they just don't have the manpower to, the manpower that they should to yeah. devote towards the veterans that they need to be treating. Yeah. But if you're in the medical profession and... It shouldn't matter how many you, patients you, you can, have. You can't treat the patient. You treat the patient the person you have in front of you. Correct. If you get so to a point where you can't do that, where you just treat everybody in the same cookie cutter fashion, which is very f prevalent. It's exactly what they like, do. I and mean, there's been so many cases of just malpractice yeah. throughout the VA or misdiagnosis. It's countless. I have a veteran. For that, for that I start reason. with this medication. If that doesn't work, I go to this Correct. one. Correct. And it's the same thing for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's not treating the patient, and that's bullshit, and that, that's when you should stop being a doctor. You should stop being a provider because mm -hmm. you're not providing for anybody. It goes against, like, everything, you know, the, the it goes against your the, oath that you take, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. First rule is to do no harm, right? Well, I actually disagree with that when it comes to <laughs> combat <laughs> medics. First first. You know, first thing you do in good medicine is return fire mm -hmm. and uh, win the gunfight. And then assess. Yeah. Get them off the X. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's just, it's, it's frustrating. And like, you want, I, I can see people being like, well, can't you commend them for trying? It's like, no, there's something more to it. And they're are, they, are they really trying? They're not really trying. We have the evidence. It's been out for a while now. 
Wake the fuck up, people. Start taking care of our guys who put it all out there on the line and have been exposed to some pretty awful fucking blasts. And they need... They deserve for it to be recognized and it not even for the compensation fact. Mm-hmm. It's it's for in their head they can say, okay, this is what's going on. Now what can we do? Can we start pulling our resources together to research and f- you know find a way to help it? And for the you guys know? that are worse off because of the medication yeah. they're taking. You know? Yeah, and realize that you don't have to be on any of that medication. Absolutely. You could take something natural like CBD and it completely wipes out a migraine. Mm-hmm. Go figure. But if Joe Rogan hears this, I'll come on your podcast and talk all about that. <laughs> so, oh man, let's uh, lighten the mood a little bit. Yeah, tell us about your trip this tomorrow slash this weekend. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to finish the jeep for this race this weekend. So Daniel's gonna go. Network and we were make we're, face. We're gonna uh, we're gonna get a little deeper into it than we originally planned. Yeah. So we were gonna rush build it. We we're gonna have the Raider one ready for the Davis Oklahoma Ultra Four race uh, on Stampede, but the metal ended up getting uh, pushed to the right for delivery. So um, that's actually a good thing because we are now going to take it to the absolute <laughs> next level. It'll be done and right. Not, not just rushed. Look out, Ultra 4, because we <laughs> are coming for you, <laughs> and we are going to beat you. And if you don't sponsor us, we'll kill you. <laughs> 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 That's a joke. I was joking. Uh, but seriously, watch out. We're coming. And uh, so, yeah. We're going to four link it. We're. It, it's going to be a monster. Should, should look at at least. I would say look look out for us on the course, but you should probably just look for us on the podium stand whenever you make it there. <laughs> look for us on the course, but I don't know if their eyes can keep up. Yeah. We've got some serious weight. Um, but yeah, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna head down. I got a campsite. I'm gonna go meet up with a guy named Trot, uh, apparently a retired Navy SEAL, um, who's plugged in with Ultra Four, and I'm gonna go meet up with him, see how I can help out, and start to get in, getting to know that side of the off road community, and start building relationships. And that's what we're trying to do with this whole deal: is connect veterans with the off-road community who are a bunch of patriots and we're just doing like-minded stuff you know veterans helping veterans exactly i don't think a lot of people understand the whole research and development side of the off-road community it's very they, intensive they just see the the final product or they or they just think like oh it's just a bunch of rednecks out like you know wasting you know wasting fuel and you know having these high horsepower vehicles that just like get mud all over them but racing breeds like or uh, what is it innovation Mm -hmm. racing breeds innovation and so and you know it's a generally good atmosphere to be around yeah so you see a lot of the stuff that comes out of like racing suspensions and everything and then like that is what brings you the ford raptor which is like a huge you know very capable truck but it's a Ford, so it's going to break. Yeah. But um, <laughs> no, nonetheless, yeah. nonetheless, it bleeds over into the civilian side of transportation. I mean, and here we are talking about in the compound, the super secret uh, research facility, you know, starting to test off road. Um, we actually did a couple of trial runs back on yeah. the, you know, the back 40. Yeah. And we're also talking about um, potentially testing, you know, uh, Mars human rovers where, you know, we're, we're bringing the lessons learned from riding around in the harshest environments, which, oh, guess what? Any place we go in space right now is pretty much that. <laughs> and if you're talking about sending people there, they're going to need to be able to ride around 
in something that's capable and doesn't break, you know. Or it, or it's made in parts that can be fixed easily, you know. Sure. I'm interested in getting in on that. It is the new space race currently. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of up and coming companies that are getting involved into the into the space game too. Yeah. So it's it's moving fast. Yeah, and if you have electric power, I know a lot of the guys are just like, ah, fuck that. <laughs> but it's like it's kinda like unlimited. I mean if you can do a solar power rocket and you can get up into the atmosphere, the sun's right there. Yeah. Unlimited fuel, you know. Mm-hmm. I know it's not that easy, but theoretically it could be I'm sure it could be possible. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm ready to. I'm ready to send it with this Jeep. Yeah, fuck it, do it live. And <laughs> uh, we still need to ramp the creek with this. Yeah, we do. This Harley we have back here. Maybe I can do that before we leave. Yeah, we'll build. Tomorrow. We'll build the jump with the tractor and pin her in fourth. She'll be good. <laughs> the speed. Let's see. It's about 68 feet across. I need to jump my Harley 68 feet. It weighs about 600 pounds. And gravity is what? It'll make it. (laughs) That's all you need to know. It'll make it. Yeah. One way to find out. Yeah. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of lighter note, did we talk about we talked about Chris Ledux? Oh time. yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Chris Ledux, who got all his inspiration from Rascal Flats. So you know. yeah, we. Uh, that's the problem with doing a podcast with two guys that blast with concussions. Yeah, is know. there'll be times that. where we're both <laughs> trying to like think right so if you have any pauses in here and you're wondering what the fuck is going on we're just trying to think we're just trying to work past that brain damage and the whiskey <laughs> at the same time yeah. well we're well we're working through that i would like to thank danny for all the help he is uh helped with uh helping me uh, organize the shop here because this place wasn't in shambles it wasn't just all boxes and this come a long way you can see maybe an eighth of it but uh it's looking pretty good now. We're getting the getting the the shop set up. Why don't you point out that awesome tube hydraulic tube bender we got to our viewers? Guy. Yep, that's gonna be uh, oh man, making our roll cage slash suspension. So yeah, we are ready. We just need to get our metal on. Yep. And by that I mean we need to get some speakers out here, some yeah, surround really sound. Do. That'll be the next deal. And I had surround sound in my last garage, and I brought it here, but I ended up putting that downstairs. So yeah. Maine could watch the movies and surround sound, so. Um, I did take a break from here over the weekend and went out to my brother, youngest brother's mm-hmm. graduation. He graduated school of mines, and I'm super proud of him. You know what's interesting? Do you, when I say school of mines, do you hear mines or minds? Mind, like your mind? Yeah, that's what you hear? Yeah, I think everybody does that. It's actually mine, like like minesweeper, like yes, <laughs> or like coal mine, or like gold mine, and more specifically like that or silver because it's in Golden, Colorado. But uh, it's yeah, a, I always thought you said school of mines, like mine, like okay, I, it's just a you know it took me for school ever to figure that out. But yeah, it's that's so weird. It's like. This whole time I've been thinking school of minds. Yeah, and, and so uh, I'm like, oh man, there must be some really smart people there, <laughs> and it's really hard to get into. Well, turns out, I mean, it's really hard to get into, and there's a lot of smart people there, <laughs> so that's why it makes it even worse. Regardless, is yeah. like there's a bunch of nerds there, so yeah, it makes sense. Like school <laughs> of minds, like the brain, you know, like this co- collective group of yeah. really smart people, like the school of minds. But it's mines, like actually like physical labor, like <laughs> geologists. And um, he actually got a geophysics degree. Um, but yeah, it's a super nerdy school, but they actually started it as a, a engineering military school. It was like all ROTC. It's like Army ROTC. 
and it basically how the army got like a lot of their engineers uh like the army corps mm-hmm. of engineers a lot of them would come from there yeah you were saying it started out it started out because yeah. of that and now graduating how many years later he's yeah. the only one he's the only one going to the army there was two air force guys but they're in master's program so he was the only one in undergraduate really? that was wow. going in the army yeah you did uh you did a couple classes after you got out right like college yeah. courses yeah uh did you run into uh liberal professors trying to push their liberal agenda on their <laughs> curriculum yeah that's another poison in society where you know a professor is not a platform to express how you feel about yeah. certain views. It, you're there to teach students factual information yeah. based on books or based on history or based on experiments or based on science or something. You're not there to push your liberal agenda on yeah. to aspiring students or, you know, onto impressionable, impressionable minds, kids, yeah. you know, and that's another big problem. Well, that's been happening for years. Exactly. There's, a, there's an interesting video I'll send you from a former Russian K- KGB agent who basically said that our school system has been taken over. by, And this video was made a long time ago. And it's scary how true it is that basically a bunch of communist socialists, you know, run our schools, our colleges. And it's been happening for Sounds years. Familiar. For years. And that's what you have today is a bunch of liberal socialist professors Mm -hmm. who run around with uh, bicycle locks and hit people in the head with them in their (laughs) their free time, you know, (laughs) from, you know, with, you know, girls and little skinny boys standing in front of them as as guards. But yes, I ran into that and um, I did a pretty good job of. It's interesting, though. The ones I had, at least they were like... Open to discussion? I think being in Texas helped. So even the liberals there, okay. like, I think they, for whatever, they respected me for being in the military and having, like, a vast life experience compared to... Everyone else they, around you. They treated a lot of the students like they're still, you know, kids, which a lot of them, you know, they yeah, kind of are. One but, of the problems, you know, going and you're taking classes and you're at this age... Point, I'm you know, probably 10 years older than some of these kids who are straight out of high school. Yeah. And it was hard to, I'm not going to say treat them lesser, but it was, it was hard to not expect a lot more out of them. Mm-hmm. And I would find myself getting really frustrated at their lack of enthusiasm or their lack of productiveness because of what, you know, I've been through. I've been through, you know, 10 years of hard life, you know, on top of, you know, compared to what they've seen. And so I like I expect a lot out of people based on the guys that we worked with and just on us in general because we expect a lot out of ourselves, so therefore we expect a lot of people we work with. Mm-hmm. And so trying to get that out of 19, 20-year-old kids who have zero life experience is um, non-existent. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of feudalistic. I mean, you gotta, I had to just kind of tell myself, remind myself, they're just coming out of high school. They're fed up with school. Like if if they even cared back in high school, which is, chances are they didn't, and their you know their parents are just paying for them to go to college. Like it is what it is, and I can't make them care. Like Correct. I can't make them, and not even like care, but just be kind of decent. Exactly. Just be be respectable of your other people, like or just, uh, or just the, to apply yourself in yeah. general. I mean, I don't, I don't I don't know why I find myself. I find me getting mad at this kid not applying himself. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. Yeah. But it kills me and just makes me so angry mm-hmm. when he doesn't even apply himself well, to something that will better himself. Group projects is where that really comes into oh, play. Oh, yes. <laughs> group projects are the worst because I'm the only one <clears throat> doing anything. Yeah. And you, it, it just, it's not that bad. It's like, okay, I'm still doing something. But then when you're having to write the professors and be like, hey, like, I'm the only one working on this project right now, just so you know. Yeah. And they're like, they would have no way of knowing unless you Correct. said something. Yeah, and that's what, like where I just had zero tolerance for it. I mean, even last year, I was just taking some other, some extra classes uh, after work. Again, just for self-improvement. You know? And, uh, and yeah, allow me. Mm. I get a little more of that. 
And so, you know, I'm working 50, 60 hours a week at a very, you know, I'm not going to say demanding job, but it's a very, you know. Complex? Yeah, I'd say complex. You know, there's vital stuff that's, you know, taken into consideration that's, you know, on, they call it, you know, flight-sensitive hardware, where yeah. if our system fails, then my airplane fails. Yeah. Oh. Yes? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Nine thirty. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, the dogs have been outside for the night. Okay. I turn the volume down so. We oh. might get the first part of that. But oh, no worries. Um, we'll see how good the mics are picking up ambient noise. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah, anyway, so we're, uh, you know, I was working 50 hours a week plus, you know, taking care of a wife, a pregnant wife, you know, expecting a baby, plus, yeah. you know, acres to take care of, and on top of everything else, and plus, you know, a couple hours of homework a night, yeah. you know, throughout the week. And I'd go to class, and yet I would be the only one that had the homework done out of these 20, you know, 19-year-old kids yeah. who have nothing better to do except for they're in school full-time, yeah. probably live at their parents' house, who knows, but you know what? Like, if I can get it done, if I can get that domain homework done with everything I have going on, there's no reason why any of these kids in here shouldn't be able to. And there are times where I was the only one. And, and, I finished and it. Let and me guess. Like, let me guess. Sometimes the professor would be like, "Okay, we'll all extend it out after you made the deadline." Multiple times. After you oh, were the only one that made the deadline, just and then they're like, "Oh, you me. know what? I'll give you another three weeks yeah. or whatever." Or he's like, like, "Yeah, he's like, and, you know, go ahead and turn it in next week." Like, yeah. And it's <sighs> yeah, but I, I at least like, I knew when they were pushing their agenda, and I would, I would argue on it, and I think. I think it was very specific to the school I was at and the professors I had. Even though they were super liberal, at least they like recognized maybe they were dealing with somebody that could actually make intelligent sure. you know, arguments based on fact. And, and they like, actually hold their own ground and not just be a sponge and soak up exactly what they say. And be able to present it in you know, a respectable manner. And it's not just somebody being like, well, like what I... You know, like what I like, believe, you know, like think is like, it's like so stupid that, you know, yeah. which is the majority of really, responses really in is. class. Oh, yeah, it really is. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was pretty frustrating. And, um, but yeah, the, I don't know why I thought about this. I I didn't want... Before I went to... So after I had that therapist visit where she just laughed at me, I was like, fuck, fuck the VA, fuck the therapist. Like, I'm going to go figure something else out. So I went to a VA center or a vet center, mm -hmm. um, which they don't have to like report to the VA. They just like tell you, hey, we're seeing somebody. And so I found this guy and... I've had pretty good luck. It's like the first person I see when I'm like trying to do something usually works out. Mm -hmm. So this guy worked out. He's like pretty cool, really nice guy. And he was helping me kind of like, this is why I thought of that. Cause like he helped me transmit transition kind of into school and like dealing with all those difficulties of dealing with stupid people and yeah. stuff like that. Where in the military, you don't have time to like put up no. with that stuff. Like it just gets squashed, you know? And you move on and you, you're able to accomplish things. But like just I knew I needed help like learning how to like deal with civilians or quote yeah. unquote normal people, which are not normal. <laughs> They're super dynamic. Any, anything but. And lazy and upsetting, you know. So I go and I'm talking to him about all these things. And then all of a sudden like I get a call that my appointment's been canceled with him, right? And that. He died. Wow, like really? right when we were about to like, you know, 
He's like, all right, we're going to really start talking about stuff. This thing's he's like, all of a sudden, it was like, he was just dead. He died of like sudden death. Out, at of, night. out of the blue, huh? Yeah. Wow. And I was like, man, were, did the things I tell him like so disturbing? He killed himself <laughs> or something? You know, I think he just like, he had one of those crazy like sudden deaths or something. Wow, that's too bad. Yeah, I couldn't stand, couldn't handle it. I was just too much. Wow. But uh, that was kind of weird. Yeah. That's, um, do you have a uh, so-called bucket list or no? Um, s- sort of. But I also, I think bucket lists are a way of not doing stuff because you're, you view it as like something... Okay, I'll I'll get to it, you know, because I'm not going to die for another 30, 40 years, so I'll get to that later. It's on the list, but I'll get to it later. I instead put things on immediately, and then I just do them. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to start off a road racing team that helps veterans. I'll just start it. Yeah, Yeah, I just see it as a... I don't have a bucket list. Of course, there's a million things I'd like to do, I'd like to see, whether it happens or not, who knows. Like, if I were to die tomorrow, you know, so... You know, hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but if that were to happen, I mean, I've just in the 30 years, or 31 years now, or the 32 years this year, huh? Just in the 32 yeah. years that we've been alive, you can just look at the last 10, just the amount of stuff that we've been through and accomplished. We've done more than, you know, most people will do in five of their lifetimes. The majority you know? of everyone in the world. And so, <laughs> yeah, 99% probably. And so if I were to die tomorrow, I couldn't be upset at all, just being knowing what what I've accomplished just personally, you know, through recon and sniper and everything else, yeah. and just in life and just succeeding through you know deployments, and knowing that I led, you know, high caliber guys through these deployments, and again just succeeding in life and all that we've been through. Yeah, if I were to die tomorrow, I would say I lived a full life and then some. And yeah. so I saw more than again. We're in, we're, we're do. just and in bonus round upon bonus round. Absolutely, right at this you point. know, and I'll keep taking like, it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I will too. So, yeah, I'll, I'll keep a, leveling up. To you know, and you, you know. talk you talk to people that you know haven't left you know their state in twenty years, or you know that are afraid to go out of the country. You know, yeah. So many people know oh, I have no desire to go out of the country. You know, this is a, I, I love my country. Why would I want to leave? Like you're not leaving, but it's a huge world out there. Yeah. Go experience cultures, experience you know ethnic mm-hmm. foods. Just you know what? You go out and look at some of the monuments of other countries, and it's just incredible architecture, incredible culture. Yes. Yeah. Like it's so it's so impactful. So much. It, so many great things out there beyond our borders. It builds you that fulfillment. Oh, it's it's kind of like... And it lets you appreciate not just America, and, you know, but it lets you appreciate yeah. humans in general and this earth in general. And at that point, you're not one country versus another. You're We're all a common being, you yeah. know? And like I said, one of the most incredible things I've been to, have you heard of uh, Petra in Jordan? Uh-uh. Look it up and Google it. It's... Uh, People know it because it's the the beginning scene of one of the Indiana Jones movies. Yeah. But it's an ancient city that was literally like carved into the mountains and oh, yeah, into yeah, stone. Yeah, yeah, I know that. And yeah. I've been I've been there twice now, and just looking at it, it's incredible. And this was hundreds of years ago. These guys had rocks and sticks to work with, mm-hmm. and the pillars are probably fifty feet tall. Of I think it was like it was called the treasury or the bank. It was like the treasury, but these pillars are fifty feet tall, and you look at them; they're perfectly symmetrical. They're circumferential. They're perfectly spaced apart. These guys didn't have tape measures. They didn't have right. you know laser markers. They didn't have tools. They didn't have sanders. They did all this with their hands, with clay, with rocks and sticks. And it's an entire city that's caved in and just these monuments. I mean, they have these 50,000-pound blocks that are stacked on top of each other 100 feet high. You know, yeah. how did they get those up there? You know, because they built tools of some sort to get them up there and just then... You know, the innovation that they had at that point and just the craftsmanship that they had. And people are afraid to get out of this country because they're afraid, you know, get out and just, if you can just appreciate that. And that was just, that's just one of 500 things you can see that will just leave you in awe. Yeah. You know, get out of your video games, get out of your TV, go out and see what, you know, mankind has produced. You know, 
The Glacier, Creek, yeah. Glacier National Park. Yeah. Oh, man. There's so many good things out there. It's one of the most beautiful mind, places yeah. I've seen. And that's within the U.S. It's very yeah. obtainable. Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. You're, you're just, you're crushing it right now with um, just really bringing it all together. Yeah. We, we are happy enough that we could, you know, uh, a Moab could land on your garage right now. We'd probably live. We we'll, we'll, we'll live through enough. We'll live through more. Yeah, yeah. Let's say, let's say a Moab takes us out theoretically, which it's not possible, yeah. but just cause um, we may or may not have anti-air yeah. defense in within the compound. Yeah. But let's say a Moab takes us out right now, just for shits and gigs and we're dead. We'd, both be content with our lives. And you know what? You're you're nailing it with your follow on, you know, whether it's advice or like just saying what's wrong with people being so plugged in their phones is it just dumbs people down. They're just in this constant like just drone meow, days. You know? Just dumbed down experience where they're like they're experiencing these things in like split seconds. They'll see a picture from their National Geographic feed, or, or a GIF of, for four seconds of, oh, okay. of that, that place. That you, cool. Of that place you described, yeah. they'll see a picture of it on their phone and they oh. sc- scroll past it. And or, they're like, "Oh, like, okay, yeah, like, oh, cool." And but yet, being there, being physically there in and front of these humbling. things, and it's this, you. taking it in with all the senses you've been given, the feel, the touch, the ground, like getting down and like. You know, the, I actually really like doing this. It's kind of a hippie thing, but I think there's actually some validity to it. It's called earthing, where you, like, take off your shoes and you just feel the dirt, mm-hmm. like, on your skin. You get take in the smells, and then you, like, open your eyes, and you see the actual vastness of what the humans before us long ago were capable of doing. I mean, they accomplished like, more then with less than what so many people do now with yeah. so much more. And, I mean, they they talk about the technology curve of how we're like, we're going to hit this, you know, where our life expectancy and all that stuff like hits this curve of, you know, upward <laughs> movement where the technology eventually advances so much. And it's happening exponentially over, you know, each year. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, everybody's becoming more numb. It's only Absolutely. it's only the people that can manage to like pull themselves out of it. And the and people like, that are you know and, that are raised in it, they don't know yeah. any better. And that's the sad part. And again. That you know, they don't know any better, so they think it's just common and natural for coming you know. coming back to what we're trying what I'm trying to promote in this podcast is the off roading, weightlifting, hunting, doing all these things that like with the off roading, we're in here spending a majority of the time. We're a race we might be racing for how long? Right? As, as long as we need to. Yeah, as long as we need to. I we're mean, probably gonna be making record you've, times. You've but, been here for a week yeah. and a half. How many times have we turned that T V on? Zero. Zero. Yeah. You know, we've but been out here expanding our bust, minds. Busting know. my knuckles up. Exactly. And physically, but mentally phys- hanging out, doing yard work, just do, you know, just like, Phys- like-minded physically. guys doing like-minded stuff. Yeah. But the, the act of actually doing something with your hands, right? Constructing something. We're breaking this thing down to its bare, you know, through all the technological advances and everything that this Jeep was designed with back in 2001 and produced. I like, was on a suspension on a piece of paper yeah, and a pencil. Exactly. <laughs> and we're stripping it down completely mm-hmm. almost. And, you know, we're eventually going to replace the engine and stuff. But ultimately, it's going to be a more capable machine when we're done with it. Right? It's going to be the idea. very much more capable <clears throat> of doing some wild things that people would see some of the stuff that this Jeep is going to go over. <laughs> and they're going to be like, there's no way. Like There's that, no way that like that, that, that creek, can go over yeah. yeah. Creek jump after we creek the jump oh, yeah. the Harley. And there's something about doing it with your hands, reconnecting with like your mind to like physically making something happen. That's and the, the self satisfaction of it too, doing it yourself rather than yeah. paying someone to do it. And that goes into hunting, gaining your food with your own two mm-hmm. bare hands, feeling the blood of that animal, the warm blood run through his, through your hands, 
after you just killed it and it's still warm. Mm -hmm. Like, and honoring that animal, like realizing that that animal just made a sacrifice for you and it's honoring you. It had lived its fulfillment of its life. Animals have short lifespans, right? Uh, not Betsy. It, and, and the, Betsy, she's at like 65 years. Exactly. So. <laughs> in, the, in the grand scheme of things, that animal is on a collision course with you. And would you... Would you there there's so much more enjoyment off of something you've you've put work into yourself, even if it's cooking the food yourself, everything like going out to the market and being very particular about the like the meats you choose or the like the vegetables you choose right it's getting your hands on it mm-hmm. something about the we're giving these these awesome feelers right where the hand can't even be replicated fully by robotics yet. Because of, they're so dynamic in their movements. And we're giving these to, like, go through the world as little explorers, you know, feeling mm-hmm. our little hands on everything. And guys like us get around the world and put our hands in a lot of different places and experience a lot of things mm-hmm. and build things. And it's so rewarding. And it's in just all aspects of life, you know. It could be building something in your garage or building dinner for your family. Like, how many times have we eaten out since you've been here for a week and a half? Mm-hmm. That first day we had lunch at you know the corner bar and that was it. I mean, yeah. I like to you know make dinner or me or Megan, Megan or I will make dinner because first of all it's healthier, it's cheaper, and you know you're spending more time with each other, talking about your day, you want, walking around the kitchen, hanging out with the baby rather than going to a restaurant, spending more money than you need to, yeah. eating subpar food, and you know just better better atmosphere. You know same thing. You know furniture. I've got a entertainment stand i've got a coffee table i've got this and that that i just made because megan wanted it I was like well if i'm gonna spend money on something might as well just make it myself you know yeah. you can make it how you want it and learn in the process and do something productive at the same time it's just you know i'm a very hands-on guy though you know there's a lot of people that aren't and that's yeah. just the you know the persona of each person but you know find your niche and and do it that's all it is yeah find things you're passionate about to stop living through other people's passion mm-hmm Stop looking at people through your Facebook, your Instagram, your Snapchat, or whatever, and think like that somehow you're living through them yeah. because you're not. You're 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 living this numbness, this <laughs> steady. Like you have these little bleeps. Like like. Meanwhile, I have these huge waves of up and down, and it's just like it's this awesome journey of being super proud of doing something and the frustration of trying to, you know, work a problem and then you work through it and then you have this rewarding feeling of like, hey, I figured that shit out. I finally got that fucking bolt. <laughs> I, was just gonna, I, was gonna, I was just gonna say, how did it make you feel when you finally pulled a whole under dash out because that one bolt that one that you spent, you know, an hour on. <laughs> Amazing. You know, it was like the ultimate release. It was like I had been cured of cancer yeah, or something. It's something so you know, simple like, like that. But when you, yeah. you know, just devote the smallest amount of time and effort to it, you know, it's just, you know, rewarding. Yeah. And I would say I didn't, I didn't know very much about working on vehicles at all until I got out of the military. It was just like. That's what you learned. So for whatever reason, yourself, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't a priority of mine while I was in to like learn it it was just easier to take care of it and it's like have somebody else deal with it but taking the time to like figure it out and get you know refusing like when something breaks i'm like i'm not taking it in Mm -hmm. i'm not taking it in to get it fixed i'm gonna do it myself and you learn so much absolutely my knowledge of how the vehicle works and every aspect of it has grown so much and it continues to grow. You're just like constantly picking things up. It's like everything I do or that I've built, I'm pretty much all, you know, mostly self-taught that I've done. And it's just probably more so just an act of stubbornness on my part. You know, like when I was, you know, trying to learn how to surf, I didn't get out of that ocean for probably three days until I got up and, you know, taught myself how to surf just as an act of stubbornness. You know, like everything I do, um, it's funny because, People ask if my dad was, you know, a mechanic or had a shop or anything. Like, no, my dad's a suit and tie kind of guy, very business smart. He's very successful. You know, I said very business oriented, but he's a suit and tie guy, you know. He needs oil change, he'll go get it done. Something repaired on his new vehicle, he go gets it done. Yeah. Me. 
I can't tell you the last the last time my truck was in the dealership was probably when it was built because mm-hmm. I've never taken my truck to the, you know I've done everything if I didn't know how to do it I learned as I did it and you do that and you just keep building upon your knowledge and you just build that library of knowledge of knowledge you know then you work on one thing or another I mean there's a Jeep there's a Dodge there's a Ford yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah you just build knowledge and you just keep putting that away and you know, some Dana comes to me and like, hey, can you work on my Jeep? I'm like, yeah, I've actually built a couple of Jeeps, you know, just from years of doing it yourself. You yeah. Know? And it's awesome. I mean, and it's, it feels good a bit to be on our side of things, you know. It does. Like we said, I mean, we, not many people can sit here and say, I'm content to die right now. Like, I don't want would, to. No, I don't. I've but, got a great life. But if it happens, great like, family. if it happens, we've lived yeah. more than a full life. And we've both, you know, pushed our our number of lives quota yeah. if you will many times so I will, we're, I, we're here for a reason I will back up and say I try really hard not to give directions and generalities to people mm-hmm. like hey you, you should spend less time on Instagram Facebook and blah 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 and I'm going to sit here and like tell you what you shouldn't, shouldn't do ultimately I'm going to go back to my mantra. Every man makes his own way in his life. And it goes for women too. And ultimately, you're going to do what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, we're just letting you know. I know what works for me and I know yeah. it doesn't. And we've, you know, if you feel like you're you're missing out on a content life, maybe explore some of the stuff that we've we've explained in or your own your own way. Or if you're not happy with your life because you're yeah. comparing yours to someone else that you see. That's your first problem. Get introspective. I've gotten weird with it, dude. I got super, like, I would do some super meditating stuff, and it worked for me. Like, getting out of the military, trying to figure out where I was, like, when medication wasn't working before I found CBD, I was able to meditate through migraines Mm -hmm. instead of just being laid out in a bed. And, yeah, it still was painful, but... Tolerable. it uh, It was just trying to, like, look at it in a different light and basically like learn to respect the the migraine as like also it, it has existence mm-hmm. like the fact that it happens it is a a something right and respecting that it's here on this earth and like it's a process which is hmm. a very interesting way of looking at it right i said i got weird with it but like but if it works, it, for you, works. it works for you. You know, when you're talking about dealing with chronic pain. And remember, it's only weird if it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. If it works for you, it works. And if you can figure out in your mind how to look at that chronic pain differently, you know, and just let it kind of pass through you where you're more of just a vessel instead of something that's being pinned down by it, you know. Sure. You're more of a tunnel that it's passing through as opposed to a wall that it's coming up against and trying to fight it. Um, it helped. It was still sucked, but it helped, you yeah, know? And something. so I think there's a lot of lesson to be learned from that and other aspects of your life as being more of a vessel instead of a wall, you sure. know? But speaking of which, if going back I mean, quite a few minutes, if, you know, the Moab was to be dropped on us right now. How happy would you be knowing that you died in the most comfortable seat you could be in? Dude. Oh, I, that's it's a PRP. Look yeah, at that. Yeah, it's a PRP huh. seat. Um, I could like, I could probably fall asleep right now. Well, if you I, probably if survive I, if we because talking, of these suspension seats asleep. that yeah. just hold you in so great. Yeah, it would just cradle us as we were getting launched thousands of feet out <laughs> into, and then the the tree canopy you have in your back <laughs> help yeah, break or fall yeah, it would hmm. maybe find some mushrooms on the way yeah. down how good were those mushrooms Dude, last those night those mushrooms were bomb yeah they fresh had, asparagus from the garden yeah. and fresh wild mushrooms what kind of Just mushrooms were those morels and they go for how much I think 40 bucks a pound yeah 40 bucks a pound we're gonna start a new business but <laughs> the, these these mushrooms were so good they tasted me- meaty. meaty. They and were I, like it's like you try to explain it like meaty, but they're just so. Flavorful. I took a bite. Took a bite of that awesome steak, which to 
I was, I was, I was beef is pretty good, right? <sighs> to Christina's. Okay, I have to. <laughs> Christina, admit, are you listening? Yeah, I have to admit, Iowa steaks are better than That's, the Texas ones I've had. Yeah. That's to you, Christina. Yeah, and yeah, that steak was bomb. And but but then I take a bite of the mushroom, and it's like oh, this is kind of like a steak mushroom. <laughs> it really like, is. It, it this tastes, is it? <laughs> why does this taste like I'm eating like a but these gamey, gamey mushroom or something? They were like big morels. They're big mm. mushrooms. Yeah. Oh man, so good. It almost had like a bacon venison flavor. So it was like. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, too good. Yeah, I'm definitely down to eat some more of those. Um, but again, going out, you have to go out and find those. Oh yeah, they're not easy. I spent to a couple find. hours yeah. out there, you know, brick and brush to find them. You know, and yet it's so rewarding. <laughs> it was probably the most rewarding thing you could. <laughs> so good. I want one right now. Yeah. And some people will just continue to just be happy and content with. Whatever the store provides them, yeah. you know, it's you know, or whatever at, the restaurant provides. Exactly, them. you know, yeah. at, at the end game, we're both eating morels, but you know, it's to to not get uh, cliche on it. It's the journey of how you get them. You can mm-hmm. drive and buy them, or you can spend a couple hours out in nature and find them yourself, clean them yourself, cook them yourself, and they think they taste that much better. Yeah. It's it's little things too. It's little moves you do in that, your life. That asparagus. Yeah. Danny and I both harvested asparagus for the first time yesterday. Yeah. I was about to just round up this entire garden patch because I was sick of all the weeds, and I decided to look in there, and there's thirty asparagus plants. I go, yeah. oh crap! Let's have asparagus tonight. And they were three foot tall asparagus. We ate good last night, didn't we? Oh yeah. Almost. There was a lot of food. Yeah. It was good. I didn't want to eat that strawberry shortcake, but I bought it, so I figured I should. Yeah. <laughs> so happens when your parents were children in the Great Depression, <laughs> right. or, or like their parents were in the Great Depression. Yeah. I think it's starting to phase out. Like the kids nowadays don't have to finish their grow, food. Yeah, and, they don't grow up, you know, frugal. You know. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's it's important to, for people to realize, like, how much they can eat. You know, oh sure. Like different people eat different levels, but also. Don't be wasteful. Like it's people, people are super wasteful. Yeah. We have a, a client that's from Switzerland, and they've been here a couple of times. And they, one of the big number one things they talk about is how much food. Because uh, you know, when we have clients, they will take them out to lunch during mm-hmm. our meetings. We'll take them out to a nice dinner, if we strike up a good deal. You know, so we'll take them out to a nice dinner. And the thing they comment on the most is how much food that American restaurants will give you. And, you know, they say, you know, honestly, half of it goes to waste because you're looking around. You've got a restaurant. Half of the tables don't eat, you know, leave half a plate full of food. And it's just the amount, you know, it's the American way. They'll yeah. load up on you. So that's a new caveat off what you, just, you were just saying. That uh, What were you just saying? Portion control. No, there's Correct, some People yeah. are super wasteful. If, if you're not, not going to eat that much if you're not going to finish your food like I, I challenge everyone to just figure out <clears throat> you know really dial it in so you, you're not wasteful you're not just correct I said we make we make a well when Danny's not here because when Danny's here we don't have leftovers yeah. he eats a lot but I hate to say when you, uh, you know we'll make a lot a lot of food for dinner and guess what I have lunches for three to four days at work you know, so many guys go out to eat every day at lunch. First of yeah. all, it's expensive. Second of all, it's unhealthy. And third of all, it's it's wasteful. Yeah. It really you, is. Because, you know, for, how many of, every, of those lunches are you eating every single piece of it? And, you know, we just found a good way. Like I, can, I can't tell you the last time Megan and I went out to eat. And we'll go every now and then as a little getaway for us. Yeah. But, you know, for dinners or this and that, I mean... Getting a pizza from Casey's, that's our going out to eat, and we do that every now and then mm-hmm. just because it's a really good pizza. Yeah. When, I, when I'm in my normal schedule, I'm doing meal prep, mm-hmm. and it's... Yeah, she does that every Sunday. She uh, preps yeah. her meals for, for the whole week, and we just make a big dinner on Sunday, so I have lunches for throughout the week, and you know, if not, we'll just make another big dinner throughout yeah. the week, and guess what? There's lunch. And I've dialed it in. I know how much 
food I consume, which is still a lot compared to most people. Mm -hmm. But I'm also working out and I'm trying to gain muscle. Where do you work out, by the way? What? Where do you work out at? At Extreme Iron Pro Gym. Oh, you don't say. They're actually one of our sponsors (laughs) for the off-road racing team. And that's actually what I was going to talk about is back to, we're going to go back into TBI, is I was told by this dumb neurologist and other neurologists, oh, you know what? Working out, that's going to trigger you to have a migraine. So you just need to stop that. Okay. So let me just be unhealthy and painful, huh? Yeah. Um, I'd rather be healthy and painful than unhealthy and painful because you're going to get a migraine either way, whether you work out or not. So why not be in shape and have a migraine than be just a fat, lazy guy with a migraine? But early on, I was following the doctor's orders. I'm like, I'm going to do everything they say to the T, and that way I have the best chance of, like, trying to get somewhat better. How did that work out for you? Terrible. Yeah. And I got started getting out of shape, and I decided when I got out of the military, I was like, this isn't working. Like, I'm out of shape. I'm starting to get depressed because I'm out of shape, Mm -hmm. not because of you know, TBI or the chance of PTSD, which I don't think I have. And, or if I do, it's like very on the minor side of it, you know, it's like. I would argue to say, even especially, you know, guys in our position, we all have it to some degree. Mm -hmm. I'd say for us, it's a very mild degree. Yeah. Some people are off the charts. Yeah. I would say, I would I say it all the time too, you know, I don't have it and it's not, you know, and if you look in the grand scheme of things, to a small degree, I would say hands down we do. Yeah. But it may be too, you know, so minute that it would not even be recognizable on a meter, so therefore we can easily say we don't have it. Yeah. And, um, well, oh yeah, the working out. So I decided I was going to, I was like, you know what? I, I'm going to have a migraine regardless if I work okay. out or not, exactly what you said. And so um, luckily I was fortunate to meet Mark Medall, mm-hmm. who owns the Extreme Iron Pro Gym, and get plugged in with him through my older brother who had already been working out mm-hmm. with him. And I had seen the progress Sam had made. Sam couldn't hold himself up in a push-up position. He'd gotten so bad out of shape. And same thing, except his was with Burns. Doctors mm-hmm. told him, hey, we got you where we can, like, pretty much you're fucked, so just deal with it. This is where you're at. Like and Sam took it upon himself? Yeah. Well, sort of. Like, it, it was motivating through Mark. That's that's okay. the beauty of, like, how much... Contrary to what the doctor said. Yeah. This is how awesome this, this gym is and what, what they're trying to do for the military and veterans is he motivated Sam to, like, hey, you need to at least be able to hold your kids, right? Like you have kids now. And that probably and struck, struck a nerve yeah, with him. Yeah, and he said, you know, yeah. you're right. I got to do this. And I got out and he's like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll figure this out together. That's the whole thing. It was like, okay, let's let's figure out how to get a is guy he, with a brain injury in super good shape. Is he in Dallas proper or where is he at? He's he's in a Richardson. It's north of Dallas. Okay. Um, but it's still like in pretty much Dallas. Okay. Um it's it's within reach to anybody that lives in Dallas. Good to know. I drive forty five minutes to go there, and it's it's well worth, worth it. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three times a week now. And so we'd been working at. Uh, so we were there when he started Extreme Iron. We were, we were there at his previous gym, and then immediately he he saw the success we were having, and how getting back in shape has so much more of an effect on other areas of your life. Where would you be now if you yeah. took the doctor's orders? Who knows? Just be know? a fat piece of lazy shit. Yeah. Like, you know? And there's but, enough of those in this world. But you start getting in shape. You start getting disciplined. You know, you start getting some good training. And next thing you know, that bleeds over to the other areas in your life. You become more focused. Like, mm-hmm. um, you learn... I. I started working out and we're doing like, you know, eventually we started out, you know, eased into it because I had to like, I had to, you know, get back in shape the right way where you're not just going after a hard right mm-hmm. away. And, but then I would get these, you know, I was still getting migraines while I was working out and I had to learn how to 
like teach myself just to push myself through mm-hmm. and just kind of work through the migraine. And the great thing about working out and lifting specifically in a gym environment. And take your mind off it. Is, yeah. And you're doing very simple movements, right? Your arm goes from here to there and back, right? So you're not doing any like fine motor skills sure. with lifting weights. And that's what I think was important. That's what I'm trying to share with guys with TBI is it's good for you to learn how to be able to still function in these like basic ways while you're having a Mm -hmm. migraine as opposed to just being completely debilitated and completely stagnant and like just laying in a bed, not moving at all, you know, but being able to work out through them in a controlled environment, right? What happens if I'm working on a machine and I just let the weight fall back? Like nothing, nothing at all. And so, you're in a very controlled, safe environment. You have a trainer there watching you, you know? And so the Iron Military program on is giving guys that are transitioning out, let's let's get you out of the house. Let's get you, you know, whether you have a job or not. Like Figure out what works yeah. good for you, what regime, what get, are you looking for? Are you looking for endurance? You looking get for strength, you, get you, you plugged in bulk, with the trainer. Get them and going. if you're not doing well financially, they're going to, Give they have sponsorships where where they'll sponsor your membership and That's awesome. and sponsor your training and get you back on your feet and get you going in a positive direction and it's amazing to see you know guys work past that and then get to the point where hey I don't need to be sponsored anymore I have a job now I have like you know people are getting jobs out of this they're they're feeling you know able to get back to work mm-hmm. and then they don't need the sponsorship anymore and so that's when. Hopefully you know, at that uh, point, they're able to give back this, to provide sponsorship yeah. to others, hopefully. Yeah. And that's really how it should be. Of, of course, one of the problems with the veteran community is a lot of people have gotten so used to, well, we need this for free. Mm-hmm. And they're not willing to put anything yeah. into it. And I think and actually one of the problems, I'm going to kind of eat off that, mm-hmm. there's so many veterans that think we should get this for free. And on the other side, there's so many veterans that are, maybe either too prideful to take anything for free. Mm-hmm. So some are looking for every single handout you can find and yeah. others don't want to touch anything free. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, you made a good point because it is important to let, let people help you too. Mm-hmm. You and know, there's some people and that don't, I don't know if they want, don't want to appear weak or if it's a pride thing, but yeah. they don't want to, they're pushed away from sometimes they'll take it as an insult. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I had two completely opposite sides veteran veteran you know what side you on or in the middle and the i think the important thing about working out in a gym in this program specifically is you you should desire to i mean it's all about self-improvement right Mm -hmm. so you're working to better yourself to a point where you don't need the sponsorship right you don't need to rely on that you want to become self-reliant like that's 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 the idea that's the whole idea the goal you know and so um so, yeah. Some some people don't like they get turned off like oh well it's not it's not just free like forever or you know oh if if somebody isn't having trouble financially like they get a discounted military route like some people some veterans we've I've met aren't even happy that there's a discounted military rate I'm like you're just an asshole yeah so if you think about it you know if they give it to you for free while well, you're in trouble. Yeah. Once you're out of trouble, think about those people that you know are in your position that yeah. you were in. Don't you think they would appreciate the help as well? Yeah. Some people don't think you know that far ahead or that far behind. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, it's just human nature and veteran or not. A lot of people just think about themselves before anyone else. Yeah. That's where the mission, the men and me, comes back into play. You know, what's good for the mission? Helping other veterans. You yeah. Know, what's good for all the men around me? And then second, what's best for me? Well, if I don't need it anymore. Let's do what's best for the mission and help the veterans that do need yeah. it. So what I'm trying to show um, <clears throat> is I, I want to spread the word in the off-road community too. Like show, you know, go to these off-road events and continue my workout programs. This is I'm traveling across the U.S., bringing Iron Military on the road with me. Uh, Iron Military out. weights are in the garage right yeah. here with us. And and then showing how bettering yourself can you know and start sharing that with some of our civilian mm-hmm. friends you know that maybe are out of shape and have let themselves go in their off community like 
show them the importance of being in shape, you know? And then it's, it's also showing the connection of getting plugged into communities of like-minded people. And I keep stressing that. And the gym community, that is, that's one of the added benefits to this program. It's not just about bettering yourself. You're starting to build relationships with people. You're bettering and, yourself with yeah. other guys that are trying to better themselves as well. Exactly. And it's not just another veteran. Mm -hmm. It's civilians. Go figure. So now you're starting to build relationships and starting to feel like a normal part of society again. Mm -hmm. And it's helping these guys transition and not feel so isolated. And that's happening within the hunting community, the the, the gym community, and the off-roading community for me. And that's what I'm trying. And I'm saying there's plenty of other, other avenues that that's happening, but I'm trying to share what I've benefited from because I've benefited greatly from from these these things. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share it with the other people. I want to share, you know, the guys who have TBI and they're feeling desperate and like this is all in my head. They need to hear this podcast. They need to know it is something. It's real, and we need we need to start speaking about it and get the word out. You know, I concur. But, anyways, we're at two hours twenty minutes. Yeah, so I'm getting kind of tired. I need to go to bed. I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. Yeah, but. Well, all right. By well, the time we're planning on it being a short one, and here we are, two and a half hours later. Yeah. What can you do? <laughs> Just keep talking. Keep going. Yeah. Keep moving forward. So I know we. Uh, Let's uh, get one last cheers. Bad luck and cheers with a oh. uh, empty glass so you don't need any bad luck on our side. Although, I think we make our own luck. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that. So, I know we've thanked uh, PRP that we're sitting in yeah. for Iron Gin. Um, I mean, pretty much the main reason that we're here is because of Warfighter made. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things. And, uh, first of all, Clinky. Charles Lahan. Trailer World. Mm -hmm. Oh, Trailer for, World as for well. For getting me up here with That's the Jeep. That's what got him in the Jeep up here in one piece. Mm. Oh, that's good. Oh, speaking of which, I was going to tell you this yesterday, but I forgot. Well, you asked me how I got that laid off the trailer. Mm -hmm. I, off. I owe you uh, some new boards on your trailer, two of them. I got a couple gouges in them from pulling that thing off. The, tra the tractor wouldn't lift it straight up. So yeah. I kind of had to slide it off, and there's a nail on the bottom of the uh, the crate. So I, I owe you some new decking. It's not it's not horrible, <laughs> but when you see it, you'll see. Sorry, right, I broke one of your coffee mugs pushing the. You jeep. you what? <laughs> oh, oh you you broke the dog mug too, didn't you? No, uh, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ooh, where, yeah. But I already ordered another <laughs> one. It should be at your house like tomorrow. Uh, so not necessary. But yeah. Uh, yeah, let's see that. I'll show you. But uh, hey, at least we uh, have a lead now for the. Yeah. For and the I got up. some compliments on uh, our background, actually. Did from, you? Uh, the the uh, recon sniper. Oh, nice. Foundation. Oh, yeah. It is important. Oh, speaking of which, might as well talk about the Recon Sniper Foundation, which does incredible things for the veteran community, not just for veteran, not just for recon or sniper guys. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you are. A veteran in dire need of help you know make sure you reach out to them because they will do everything in their power to help you or die trying mm -hmm. and you know there's a lot of people that are afraid to ask for it and to ask for help you know whether it be pride or you know whatever reason you may have but those guys are you know top-notch fellas oh, yeah. and so you know financial hardships emotional hardships you know family problems if you need someone to talk to or you know if Again, financial hardships, you know, just reach out to them and tell them, you know, what's going on. And if they can't help you, they they will try and find someone that can't. Yeah, and they'll so use they'll use their network and yeah. get you plugged and in somewhere. Th that's the thing we were talking about earlier. I'm going to, I know we talked about killing it now, but um, uh, a buddy of mine who works with the Recon Sniper Foundation, he's on the board. And there's so many people that just take advantage of freebies and handouts as we're talking. You know, saying they have, you know, or the, one of the many cases they had someone write in, you know, who's currently enlisted, you know, asking for money because he can't afford cable in his barracks, you know. And he's like, so, and then at that same time, I open an envelope from a check for uh, $50 or $100 from, oh, you know, a Vietnam veteran 
He was living in a in a trailer with no power. You know, has three sets of clothes, and who had zero money. You know, and he is donating money to the foundation. And yet this, you know, E4 is writing, asking us for money for cable for a month. Yeah. It's like, what are your priorities? You know, and that just shows you that there's, you know, regardless of where you go or who you are or what you do, there's people that are always going to take advantage of it and the people that are always going to be, you know, the you know, influencers of it. I don't know the best word, but, you know, there's always, yeah. there's always the people that carry it and the people that take advantage of it and you know you hope you can you know outweigh it with the people that deserve it than the people that are asking for it they don't need it again spend some i would i would say a good meter to try and figure out where you fall on that if you come up with this particular situation you're wondering if you should get help for it is first try, of all, try and get a little introspective and think have i done everything i can do to, to get this done before or, you ask for help from someone yeah. else, you have to make sure that you've been you have helped yourself to your utmost you know, yeah. capacity. And and that's know, that's number one problem in a lot of this world is people don't want to put the effort to help themselves first and they want someone to fix their problems for them. Yeah. But also realizing your limits. So you're not pushing yourself, pushing yourself until there's a snap mm-hmm. and you break and then it's too late to ask Correct. for help. You, exactly. So so somewhere there's, there's somewhere on that line, meter there's a fine where, line you have to, you know, traverse. <laughs> So about the time you say, hey, you know, I, I feel the the pressure wall is coming in. This is like, this is heading in the right, wrong direction. That's a good time to ask for help. Correct. And so before the levy breaks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a foundation like this can come in and put their fingers in the holes and say, hey, let's figure out a way to get this plugged up. We'll right? covered. We'll get, yeah. get you back on your feet. But, but, you, but you know what? Having cable for a month, you'll live. Yeah, dude. There's people that need a lot more help on that that aren't I, even asking for it. I haven't had cable in, I don't know, since I left high school like, yeah. or something. <laughs> I've been fine without it. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, that yeah. was a very, you know, they're good. there might be more to do with than that, but that's very broad. And, again, the Recon Sniper Foundation does great things for the veteran community as a whole, uh, especially, you know, Guys that find themselves in hardships, not even yeah. guys, uh, veterans that find themselves in, hard, in hardships. I don't want to assume any genders. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're great guys and a great community. Um, another, we talked about last time, of there's so many not great nonprofits out yeah. there. You know, we, Warfighter Made is one of the best. You know, We Kind of Cyber Foundation is one of the best nonprofits you can donate to, donate yeah. to, contribute to. Or if nothing else, just get a hold of him and say, hey, what can I do to help? Yeah. Um, Again, not just for recon or snipers. Yeah. Veterans of all of all aspects. And or, in, I'm sorry, military and veterans of all aspects. How's that? Iron military near, um, needs needs your help spreading the word to veterans in the Dallas area. It's a great they, program. They need to get plugged in to this gym. I'm telling you, it's... Such an awesome community. Um, but anyways, it's been a pleasure getting this uh second one done with you. And Maybe. I'm glad I'm really glad we were able to cover the TBI stuff because Yeah, that you can go on for days with that. I was sitting And you're there. very more well read and versed into that than uh than I am. And uh Well it's that's nice something because that we you, should all all of those that are not only suffering from it, but all of those around us affected by it should know more about it and yeah i should look more into it and i've kind of fallen into i'm gonna say the trap but uh just kind of got fed up with the va and just kind of said whatever i'll live with it you know and that's the wrong mentality and i know that you know uh, because you've definitely definitely been proactive as far as trying to learn more about it and but i haven't i haven't necessarily been proactive in speaking about it and that's what i'm trying to change that's true and so I was in the same boat with you. I just got fed up, but then I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure out what's works for gonna, me. I'm not going to take these pills. You know what? Yeah. I'll, I'll go outside and, you know, if it gets to it, you know, there's been, like I said, there's been a couple times where I've had to call into work because of a debilitating migraine, but, you know, I've, most of the time I've learned to try and, you know, work through them or, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm here, I'll, you know, Megan's like, oh, you know, if you got a migraine, you know, why don't you lay in bed? I'm like, well, I'm going to have a migraine either way. I might as well get the, the lawn mode while I'm at yeah. it, you know? And, and again, that's, some people will be like, oh, were you, well, you're still functioning, blah, blah, blah. 
they're not taking into effect what kind of exceptional people we are. Correct. That we can work we have through very, something. Very high pain what, tolerance. What <laughs> what wouldn't put somebody else in in the fucking dirt? Sure. Is we're we're finding a way to somehow work through mm-hmm. at this very lower level, you know. Sure. And but yeah, it's I'm definitely I, I sort of have just even today reading that news report feel a calling. Like I was gonna figure out how I could fly out there mm-hmm. and go to this thing and basically be like, Hey, this is the real deal. Why don't you talk to somebody that's actually like Sure. You know, I understand this guy took shrapnel to his head and everything, but like the exact same thing we're looking for. Let me let me talk if you give me a second, let me talk to you about you know, multiple exposures to blast wave to blast wave concussion and how that is different and how we need to get away from labeling it as PTSD. So, yeah, I'm I'm looking to start start speaking out and putting out more videos. Pressed upon exponentially. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm gonna put out some more videos, just individually talking about that. Probably just like a vlog type thing, me sitting down in front of a camera and trying to just kind of share some of these things we were talking about mm-hmm. in a more digestible like format. Sure. But yeah, those of you that uh, stick with us for the two plus hours, I commend you. Yeah. Although, I mean, I'm sure you've been on the edge of your seat the entire time. So, I mean, this is a good you should one. commend us for being able to entertain you for so long. This is a good one to share within the veteran community. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. To, for, for all the guys out there with and TBIs need to hear this. not even scratching the surface of yeah. what needs to be done. Yeah. Let's start this discussion. Yeah. Let's do it. Co- comment on the video. You already did. Yeah. You already, and, you already started it. Yeah. And, you know, if anybody else has any input, they want to say I'm full of shit. Well, I'm not, and I know more than you, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Let's yeah. uh, wrap this one up. Yeah, maybe uh, shoot for a, a quick one, a quick podcast in the morning before you leave, maybe for a, a little, yeah. Down, down and dirty 15, 20-minute one. Okay. Sounds good. Maybe. maybe so. All right. All right. And, and it was that for the clinky. We're going to clink, and we'll be out. Yeah. Thanks for listening again. Did we mention Warfighter Mage? We did. Yes. Who else are we getting? Oh, no. We, we mentioned almost everybody. All right. Just making sure. We've got to yeah. take care of the people who yeah, take okay. care of you. Okay. Well, now we got a clinky. All right. That's clinky. This is out. And we're out. Sure.